Good afternoon. This is the Energy, Energy and Environment Committee, Environment and Energy Committee. <laughs> and I am having Tuesday morning confusion. Um, we are going to continue our discussions of S100 and Act Relating to Housing Opportunities Made for Everyone. And our first witness will be uh, Sue Minter. Welcome, Sue Minter. Sue, are you with us? You are muted. <clears throat> Oh, that is not good. Can't hear us. We can now see you. <laughs> and let's see. Um, I don't know if there's anything I could be doing here. The channel three was muted this morning. <laughs> really? Can I, can yes, I cannot hear you. Oh, we you can, can hear, hear me. Yes. Okay. Can you hear us? Um, I can start my testimony, Madam Chair, but I don't hear you. Would you like me to try to exit and re-enter, or would you like me to just share my testimony? And if you can put a note in the chat. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Um, so can you chat with her and see? Maybe she should try not using her headphones. Yes, if you could start. You could start, I guess. You can do it this way. <laughs> no, I can't hear. It's not the headphones. Yeah. Well, you have to unplug them. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they are Bluetooth. Me? We can. You can hear me. And I still can't hear you. Hear you. <clears throat> Do you want me to just go ahead, Madam Chair, at this point? Okay. Yes. Let's get us started. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, technical inconvenience. I just want to um, thank you all very much for uh, inviting me to join you uh, for what I understand is uh, an attempt to talk about housing. Uh, and equity and some of the very serious challenges that our most vulnerable Vermonters are facing right now in 2023. For the record, I'm Sue Minter. I'm the Executive Director of Capstone Community Action, which is a community-based anti-poverty nonprofit, which was established in 1965. We serve the counties of Washington, Lamoille, and Orange Counties and are one of five community action agencies across the state that make up the Vermont Community Action Partnership, VCAP. So the great folks who work for us at Capstone are really what I would say on the front lines of the war on poverty, providing crisis support for those who face food insecurity, housing insecurity and homelessness, or just enough heat to stay warm through the winter. We also work to build ladders out of property by providing tools and opportunities to help our clients gain economic self-sufficiency and self-esteem. So really I'm here to provide perspective from the lens that I have. Watching Vermonters literally wait outside in the dead of winter without warm clones just for our food shelf to open. I'm speaking from a place of seeing the economic and racial divide in Vermont continue to grow and experiencing the trauma and despair among a growing number of Vermonters as we all try to exit this global pandemic. And I'm here to reflect on the bill before you and try to provide perspective on the incredible urgency that literally thousands of Vermonters who will soon be unhoused from area hotels or who face eviction from the inability to pay their rent. From where I sit, it is clear that from ev on every level, we have a severe housing shortage in Vermont. And this shortage is negatively affecting every region of our state in its own unique ways. And I know you've learned the macro picture of 
the current undersupply of housing and the increasing demand for housing and the concurrent escalation of price in our existing housing so stock. And the lack of stable housing and a growing housing supply means that Vermont's economy faces stagnation without adequate ability to attract a diverse workforce and threatening our businesses and our community vitality. It is so clear to me that Vermont needs to rapidly scale up housing and housing density of all types and at all income levels as quickly as possible. And I wanna say that in this sort of moment of racial reckoning, Vermont also needs to face the structural inequalities and racism that is built into the many forms of restrictions and regulations that have become significant barriers to building housing throughout Vermont. And this is why I strongly support S100, which seeks to remove some of these barriers. It's also why I'm working with other committees of jurisdiction in the legislature to increase funding for the supply of affordable housing and shelters, along with supportive housing services. So I also wanna say as a matter of full disclosure and potential relevance that I have a history in my career of working in the planning field. My degree is in planner and I worked for 10 years at the Vermont Department of Housing in community planning, downtown revitalization, also as a local planning commissioner in my town of Waterbury, a staunch defender of Act 250 and a promoter of smart growth, including when I served as secretary of transportation, I established new programs to expand public transportation and to marry planning uh, with transportation funds to create great places, walkable downtowns and community centers. And now in my new role, combating the causes and conditions of poverty, I've also begun to better understand how some of the unintended consequences of some of these very policies in our current economic context. So each year, some 11,000 Vermonters will walk through one of Capstone's many doors, seeking healthy food, warmth during our hard winters, early education programs for vulnerable at-risk children and their families, and for help navigating what is only described as a Byzantine system for navigating people needing to find a roof over their head. During the last federal fiscal year, Capstone's frontline housing support team worked with 523 families. So we see Vermonters who come to our doors in desperation. They come from all walks of life. They're senior citizens, families with kids, single working adults, people with disabilities. And they're really bound together by a common thread of se severe insecurity of losing the stability of a home because they can no longer afford their rent or the extreme challenge of being unhoused altogether. Right now, in Washington County, there are 375 adults and children sheltered in area motels. In Lamoille County, 146 adults and 46 children were in the motels. Across our Head Start program, 30% of the children we serve are homeless. And across the whole state, there are over 2,000 adults and 600 children who are currently living in area hotels. And after this July 1st, their collective fates are unknown. Capstone staff provide supportive services, case management, other key tools to help lift people into stable housing. And over just the last five months of our service, our housing team has worked with 212 households in search of housing, but only 35 of them have been able to find safe and affordable long-term housing. And this is because there is simply no available housing for the folks at this level of housing need, particularly those who are unsheltered and unhoused. And just, this is in despite of new vouchers, the Section 8 program, it's been considered a lifeline. This is the very resource that used to be considered a golden ticket, but there's literally no place to throw the life preserver. 
After years of our staff working tirelessly to get their clients into the Vermont Rental Assistance Program, VRAP, they are now faced with letting the clients know that not only has the program ended, but there's nowhere for them to go. One of the capstone counselors, housing counselors, sadly calls Section 8, quote, the program of empty promises. So we couple this gaping disparity of available apartments, vouchers, and skyrocketing rents, and we understand why Vermont is ranked set in the country right now, in Atlanta, California, I believe, for the rate of homelessness. And as difficult as it is right now, I am deeply worried about what lies ahead, because during this very month of April, a cascade of pandemic era supports are dissolving or gone. April marks the end of the SNAP three squares emergency allotment, which will affect over 70,000 Vermonters. April is also the end of our Vermont Everyone Eats food program. In central Vermont alone, where we've been the hub distributing over 5,000 nutritious meals every week. This is also the month when the Medicaid unwind is beginning, again, affecting low-income Vermonters accessing their health care. And the Vermont child tax credit is also on the chopping block in this body. And then there is VRAP, which not only has helped provide safety to house some 2,500 Vermonters in area hotels, it has also provided critical rental assistance for some 10,000 Vermonters. And we're really just beginning to see what the effect of removing this rental assistance will mean as many clients are coming to our aid facing evictions in homes they can no longer afford. So we really have yet to experience the full impact of these programs ending. But I really am here to say we can't think that we can just go back to the way it was pre-pandemic. We are now facing a new era of housing uh, unavailability and costs coupled with high food costs, fuel and heat for transportation that we've really never experienced before. And we are working with our area partners to try to prepare for the unhousing of hundreds of people just in central Vermont. Right now, the state is estimating that in Washington County alone, about 100 people will be unhoused from the hotels at the end of May and 200 at the end of June. And the general assistance GA program is really on the precipice statewide of exiting more people from the motels this summer than we've ever seen. So we're trying to plan for this. We work with area partners, communities, public safety officers. The guests we support in our GA subsidized motels are elderly, some are infirm, living with disability or mental illness or substance misuse. Many are fleeing domestic violence or they're simply Vermonters who work every day and return home to a motel. Well, far from a perfect model, these motels have been a lifeline and we can't find our community, the, the lifeline that we can't find in our communities without a diverse housing stocks. Guests have found recovery jobs, they've gotten healthy, had their surgeries, and they've also found compassion and serve with our service providers. If these motels close as proposed, we will truly be facing a pandemic and of poverty and homelessness across our state. And I need not remind you all of the very real dangers involved in this moment of supporting people who are unhoused. <laughs> we all grieve the tragic murder of a young Vermonter, Leah Rosen Pritchard, whose passion was to spread radical love by providing shelter for those in need at Morningside House in Brattleboro. So as difficult as the current situation is, I do see signs of hope. I see hope in every victory that our staff achieve finding people a home, a healthy meal, and a job. And across the state, our Community Action Network has served over 1,400 individuals experiencing homelessness to find permanent housing during the pandemic. 121 Vermonters experiencing homelessness were provided 
emergency housing, and 714 in individuals experiencing homelessness were helped to find permanent housing. I see hope in the historic investments into the affordable housing and shelter programs that you all have made through this pandemic. When built, these will really help, although not solve our current challenges. I also see hope in the hard work that has delivered us this needed legislation, S-100. This bill tries to remove barriers and help incentivize communities to build more housing at greater density. Removing these barriers will be a critical investment in the long term for Vermonters. But from where I sit, it cannot come quickly enough. I want to emphasize in particular this, our strong support of the sections, uh, section 4412-1H, which prohibits bylaws from penalizing a hotel for renting rooms to provide housing assistance through the GA programs, as well as section 44. 413 a one g um, which restricts the ability of communities to prohibit emergency shelters. Both of these sections will assist the serious need for GA assistance and new shelters. At this moment of national racial reckoning, and as Vermont seeks to address the forces that continue to make our state unwelcoming to BIPOC Vermonters, I strongly believe we all need to think carefully and constructively about the rules we set around where and what people can build or not build. We need to recognize that many of the rules that we have put in place over decades are now limiting access to young people, to low-income people in the BIPOC community. These rules are effectively denying the economic diversity that our state and community needs and they are upholding a structural racism that makes our state unwelcoming. Addressing poverty has never been easy and our homelessness challenges are not going away and we must forge onward. I believe S100 is a chance to begin to unravel those barriers and to enable communities to finally remove structures that stand in the way of a more diverse and welcoming Vermont. And I'm just gonna conclude my comments with a quote about hope from Barack Obama. Because without hope, we have despair in this difficult moment. Hope is not blind optimism. It's not ignoring the enormity of the task ahead or the roadblocks that stand in our path. It's not sitting on the sidelines or shirking from a fight. Hope is that thing that sits inside us despite all evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us if we have the courage to reach for it and work for it and to fight for it. Hope is the belief that destiny will not be written for us, but by us, by the men and women who are not to content to settle for the world as it is, who have the courage to remake the world as it should be. And I thank you for your time and all of your dedication and service and for your courage in this important moment. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. I don't know what to do, Madam Thank Chair. You. Yeah, uh, so we can't ask questions, I guess, um, but she has it, she's got okay. to leave a um, message in the chat. Simone's a uh, representative. May we Smith. comment? I don't know what else to do. Um, we can try to go out and come back in and see if I can hear at a separate time. Would that be a good idea, Madam Chair? Okay. You can um, give me a thumbs up, things down. So, uh, I don't know. We, we got to keep going. I think um, I think we'll say goodbye. thumbs down. You're just going to say goodbye. Okay. Sorry. Thank you all so much. I know you've been working hard on a lot of things, and this is a big one. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'd like to ask a, the committee a question. Okay, what's your question? Well, and I wrote this down, so I'm going to read it if that's okay, so I'll get it right. Okay. I believe this bill does not belong in environment and energy. I mean, this testimony, I should say. This is a housing bill, and we are not the housing committee. We should be adding, <laughs> we should be addressing Act 250. I need to put these on so I can see what I'm talking about. Uh, 
uh, we should be addressing Act 250. Uh, I believe general housing has uh, has been passing the buck to us here at this committee. The bill needs to be divided somewhere around page 35. Our part is first. Uh, housing is the second part. Uh, racial and BIPOC should not be entering into environment and energy when we have issues uh, with Act 250 to address. That's my opinion. Uh, and I, I think that somewhere toward the end of this bill uh, that, like I said, I think housing uh, kind of passed the buck to us on it, the entire bill. Okay, that's, we'll have time for discussion. It seems like a good topic for discussion. All right, All right. Yeah, that's good, thank uh, you. Represent, um, Brian Shoup is our next witness. Welcome, Mr. Shoup. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm Brian Shoup. I'm the executive director of the Run Natural Resources Council. Uh, BNRC has been working on issues related to land use planning and development regulation and natural resource protection for 60 years. Um, almost always as a defender of <clears throat> strong and appropriate regulations to help communities guide growth in the state. <clears throat> My own background before coming to VNRC in 2008, I spent about 25 years as a community planner working throughout the state, working on a lot of the regulations that um, um, not only are working to shape the growth and development in the state, but also are in many instances providing uh, barriers to and in, in, including exclusionary practices for smart, compact residential development. And I think we're here and generally in support of uh, S100 um, as it was passed out of the Senate with a couple of provisions we'd like to comment on. Um, Last summer and fall, Katie Gallagher, our Sustainable Communities Program Director, and I participated in, I don't know, maybe a dozen meetings uh, of stakeholders, with stakeholders who were convened by Representative Bongarts to try to find common ground on how we could improve our um, zoning practices in the state by changing Chapter 117 to try to eliminate some of those exclusionary practices that have, have created barriers to the type of housing that I think Vermont needs. Um, and I, I really want to uh, commend the Representative Bongards and state my appreciation for really having found a lot of common ground, a lot among diverse interests. And I think that was an important thing. Um, and I think that many of the uh, provisions of this bill reflect that effort and, and should, be, should move forward. Um, before I talk about specific provisions of the bill, though, I would like to kind of address the overriding issue of whether to focus on zoning or Act 250. Um, our uh, our uh, advice and what we would urge the, the committee to do is really to focus on the zoning provisions for several reasons. Um, there, this is part of a national trend where it's fairly well documented. I know you're gonna hear from other witnesses who have done some of that documentation that zoning practices have created barriers across the country. We have a national housing crisis, not a Vermont housing crisis, or not only a Vermont housing crisis. Um, <clears throat> the factors of affecting that crisis may differ a little bit from state to state, but we, we are, a lot of states are dealing with the same issues. So you're not alone in looking at how towns regulate land use through their zoning regulations and other land use regulations to try to uh, accommodate more, a greater mix of housing types and affordability. Um, so Act 250 and zoning serve different purposes. Act 250 addresses the environmental community impacts and community impacts of larger developments, including those with regional impacts. It doesn't prescribe the use, the location, the density, the dimensional characteristics of any use, except as they relate to site-specific um, details, you know, it, whether it's impacting a, a wetland or a, a, a form of you know, wildlife habitat. Um, it doesn't define where development should be with the exception of whether it complies with the municipal plan and whether it's in certain designated locations. I'm going to talk more about that later because that's an important consideration, I think, as you consider the bill moving forward. Um, but really, whether a community supports compact neighborhood development and a mix of housing types really depends on the local zoning. Now, you can have a 10-acre lot that has very similar characteristics. It's flat, it's wooded. Uh, one community might allow 50 units on it. Another community might allow 10 units on it. Another community might allow one unit on it. And that's based on a lot of variables, a lot of them legitimate, where the, the, the um, property is located. 
um, what the purpose of that zoning district is, what the overall plan for the community is and how that 10 acre lot fits into that overall vision. But we came to the conclusion, I think, working with the stakeholder group last year is that in those areas where we have water and sewer infrastructure, we should accommodate the, as, as dense and as compact a pattern of development as is appropriate with certain caveats. And we should also make sure that we're promoting a mix of housing types, not just single family homes. And single family zoning has been one of the probably more significant nationwide barriers to diverse housing and greater affordability in the country. And this bill addresses that issue. Uh, and I think it does so in a way that maintains the ability of communities in the state to also protect our natural resources, um, especially those in outlying areas outside of those uh, areas served by water and sewer. So, um, It's another one of the, one of our concerns as we talk about the the zoning and Act 250 dichotomy is the legislature has been dealing with Act 250 and trying to make adjustments to it to pro promote affordable housing for at least 20 years. The legislature has not dealt with zoning and the barriers that zoning might prevent present to, to uh, affordable housing for over 20 years. The last meaningful effort that I'm aware of was in 2021 when the legislature. Uh, established a committee to look into barriers to affordable housing that are in, embedded in Chapter 117. I, I had the distinction of being a consultant to that committee, and a lot of the pieces that are in this bill um, were considered by the committee at that time, requiring uh, duplexes to be treated like single-family homes, um, uh, requiring certain densities where communities had the infrastructure to support it. They were considered a little too controversial at the time. They weren't pushed forward by the legislature. <clears throat> Looking back, that was probably a mistake. I think we could have made a lot of progress on housing affordability had we taken action at that time, and we didn't. However, since that time, there's been a lot of a lot of land use changes related to Act 250. Um, the, the, the legislature has... Uh, significantly increased the jurisdictional trigger for mixed income housing in downtown development districts. We've uh, created other designation programs, the new town center program, which has been amended over time to create housing in those, those communities that don't have a historic downtown, but have want to create one. Um, probably most significant, we've created a growth centers program um, to help communities plan for you know, regional centers for compact development that also have um, exemptions and, and meaning for Act 250. And probably most significantly during the Shumlin administration, the legislature created the uh, Neighborhood <clears throat> Development Program. And that program is intended to look at uh, our village centers, our downtowns, our other designated areas in the area <clears throat> around them that are within walking distance to our downtown, to our village centers, and create a pathway where uh, priority housing projects, which is a defined term, certain certain mix of housing types can be exempted from Act 250, provided the community has gone through kind of that pre-screening project to get designated as a new town center. Um, I'm uh, I know Chris Cochran and um, uh, Jay Kimmery have uh, folks from Department of Housing and Community Affairs have uh, testified on the programs. They are much better than I am at talking about the nuts and bolts of them. But they're all important programs, and, and they're all programs that were intended for different purposes, not necessarily to be a substitute for Act 250, and I'll, I'll expand on that in a second. Um, with regard to the new town, the neighborhood development area program, my understanding is that nearly 3,000 uh, priority housing project units have been created in those areas since the program was initiated about six or seven years ago. And just last year, the legislature made significant changes to that, uh, that law. We were involved in that to make it easier for some of the smaller communities to, to um, use the program. Um, it also last year uh, increased the cap of how many housing units could be considered a priority housing project in those areas that could be exempted from Act 250. Um, that just went into effect, I believe, July 1 of last year. So it really hasn't been given a lot of time. But there has been a steady um, uh, steady work done on trying to align Act 250 with the state's land use goals. Uh, this committee, or I guess your predecessor, the 
Committee on Natural Resources and Fish and Wildlife um, has passed two bills out of the two comprehensive Act 250 reform bills out of the House. Uh, at least one of them was passed out of the Senate, um, which really took a, a comprehensive approach to saying, how does Act 250 work? How does it look at, at different locations differently? Um, our position is that Act 250 probably doesn't add the value that it used to in certain areas that have been through the designation process. It's also failing to protect natural resources in other areas where we're seeing fragmentation of our forest land, um, development in river corridors and, and other issues. So, so we have been encouraging that comprehensive approach. Um, the inability to get it Act 250 passed into law, you know, it's one thing to pass it out of this building, it's another thing to get it signed into law, prompted the legislature last year to um, direct uh, two different studies. They allocated funding for the Department of Housing and Community Development to study the designation programs and take a hard look at, at, at all of their different purposes, whether they're all needed, whether they can be streamlined, whether they can be improved, and how they should interact with, with land use regulations like Act 250 to really try to better align them um, to, to serve the purpose of saying, okay, these are the areas we want development. These are the areas that we've, we've identified the, the barriers and the, and the uh, environmental impacts that might be avoid, avoided through designation and make, make those pre designation programs work. The state's just hired uh, a group, Smart Growth America, a national organization who's been a leader in promoting smart growth policies across the country working with some local folk, local planning consultants to do that work. And we're really excited about it. Um, this um, legislature also directed the Natural Resources Board to look at two different things, to look at locational jurisdiction, which is what we've been moving to with all of those designations in the neighborhood development area and the downtown development district jurisdictional triggers to say, how do we make locational jurisdiction a consideration in Act 250? Um, as it was passed, there was only one location that triggered Act 250 automatically land above 2,500 feet elevation. And that was recognized that those areas are very sensitive. Um, we need to make sure that even, even a single home in a large driveway can have a, a significant impact in those areas. Are there other areas in the state that should be treated simil similarly? So the NRB is looking at that. They have money in the budget and are, are seeking out a facilitator to help them with that work now. The other issue that they're looking at is, is the administration of Act 250. Um, and this committee, or this committee's predecessor, did a lot of work on the administration of Act 250 last year. There's one thing I'll say about um, changes to Act 250 that have been made over the years. Uh, in 2002, 2004, um, when Act 250 was last, overhauled in a comprehensive way, uh, the legislature eliminated the environmental board and and the appeals process went to the courts. Research that we've done recently show that the appeals process takes about twice as long now in the environmental court as it did under the environmental board. Every developer I've ever talked to says time is money and the appeals process, although rare in Act 250, uh, only one or 2% of projects, and that's all projects, not just housing, are appealed in any given year. And, and there's a lot of good data available from the Natural Resources Board. Um, and that one or two percent is don't hold me to it in any one year, but that's pretty much my understanding of the average. Um, that that process, that the administration of Act 250 is is in need of repair, and that should be an important consideration. We're glad that the NRB is looking into that as well. So, so that's my background on uh, before getting to the bill. I would like to talk about um, some specific sections of the bill. If that's okay. Unless there's any questions before I go ahead. Yeah, the members have back questions on the background. Representative Tory. Just a quick question on these studies when they're going to be done. My understanding um, is by next legislative session. I believe, I don't know which one was supposed to be done in July, and it likely won't be, and they're going to be seeking an extension. But our goal and, I, and our hope, and I think the goal of the legislature in passing those studies was that they be available for you for consideration next year. Um, and I know we, we joke sometimes in our office that, yeah, a study is great. It's better than taking action. But I think these are the most meaningful studies when it comes to an important law that's guided development in the state over the years. And we really should get the information in the public process that's going to be coming out of them. So, um, yeah, I do want to be sensitive to that. Representative Sibelia. Yes, thanks for your testimony. Um, think that we have a housing problem in the state that we need to build housing in the state do i think so yes and 
um, do you have an opinion as to where we should build that housing? Yes, I, I believe that we should respect what has been a land use kind of overarching policy of the state for years of compact settlements surrounded by open countryside, working lands and natural areas. Um, you know, compact development. So before coming to Vermont, just so you know, I, I was spent a short time as the policy director for an organization called the Vermont Forum on Sprawl, who became Smart Growth Vermont. And we we were a proponent for Smart Growth. That organization went away and we incorporated their tools and policies and programs into VNRC's Sustainable Communities Program, I believe in 2011, 2012. So going section by section, we support, oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, regional planning, uh, different towns that have uh, town plans that already have something along these Act 250 rules in place. Do you feel that there might be enough or do you think there needs to be more legislation rule overruling local planning? Um, I don't know that I don't know that it overrules local planning. I do believe that uh, there are instances where Act 250 may not be required, and when communities who are regulating development um, and and will that still come into play? Do you think? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm also I would have to say I'm a proponent of regional planning in a region setting a regional vision and having some accountability for communities in their zoning processes or their planning processes. Um, so we support section one, which puts a cap on uh, the amount of parking that communities can require. It's important to point out that um, we would propose that uh, one parking unit per dwelling unit would be adequate and developers will likely continue to provide more parking um, as an amenity, you know, perceived amenity for their their um, tenants or, or customers. But, uh, you know, what we can do to decrease our reliance on this single occupancy automobile and build compact developments that serve by other transportation options is important. So just, I'm, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail for time's sake, but just tell you what we support and where we might have concerns. So we support that section. Um, we do support section two, um, which is probably the most consequential piece of legislation or piece of this legislation to require that duplexes be treated equally as single family homes and it doubling up our density, even in rural areas, uh, you know, single driveways serving two families in a single building as opposed to serving one. Um, that was a consideration 20 years ago. And as I said, it was probably a mistake not to have done it then. We also support where you have water and sewer service areas, um, allowing a fourplex as a use by right um, uh, in all of those areas. We also support the provision that requires a minimum density in areas that are served by water and sewer. With one concern, um, we are concerned about the provision on page five, nine, lines nine and 11, uh, which we believe might be too narrow in limiting the types of environmental features that can be protected under zoning. Um, this is particularly a concern in a handful of communities that, have, in my opinion, have made a mistake in the past by overextending sewer and water service areas to areas that really aren't appropriate for compact development. And that in those areas, um, we're not saying they should be allowed just to have large lot zoning served by water and sewer, but they should, we should expect communities to carve out natural features that should not be developed and that don't allow development. And we just would hope that would be clear in the bill. We do, and I'm sorry, I should have said at the beginning, I do have written testimony. It's still got some holes in it and I'd like to submit it after the fact. I can fill in a couple of blanks, but we do have some specific language changes. And one of them would be um, where it says, a, a, an area served by municipal water and sewer service area means several things, including it excludes flood hazard or in, inundation areas as established by statute, river corridors or fluvial roads and areas as established by statute, shorelands, and we would add, or within zoning district or overlay district whose purpose is environmental protection and wherever new year-round residential development is not allowed. Um, and I, I hope you would consider that language to make sure that there's some communities that I'm aware of, and I'm sure that you're going to hear from, have water and sewer areas that have overlay districts that have pre prevented development or pre that they want to prevent development from being in, but they're in this larger area. So that's one 
particular specific change that we'll provide um, writing for um, or uh, uh, suggested language for. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. Why focus on all the overlays? And what I, I, underlying I, zoning was addressing it. I'm not focusing on overlays. I wouldn't reference overlay. I just, that was an example. I think that, that the zoning could have features that are off limits for development and that should be appropriate. Um, just a, an aside to that too, I did, um, we're talking about uh, water and service, and served by water and sewer infrastructure. We often talk about water and sewer service areas. I did look at the statute that authorizes municipalities to manage their sewer systems. And it's, it's pretty vague. It implies that they can manage it for land use goals or development goals. And I know some communities do. They will have a carve out for affordable housing, for example. They'll, they'll draw district boundaries that are intended to, to um, implement their land use goals or their environmental protection goals. But that's not uh, authorized under statute explicitly. And there's no definition of a water and sewer service area or a sewer service area. And, I'd like to suggest some language, I haven't drafted it yet, that would change that statute to make it clear that a municipality can manage its, its infrastructure in a way that um, furthers the goals of its town plan, promotes you know, housing or promotes economic development, whatever their, their goals are, um, and protects the environment by avoiding extension into certain areas. And municipalities do have sewer service ordinances that do that. It just doesn't seem to be clearly authorized. It's not prohibited either. So it's just maybe a little bit of a uh, uncertainty that communities are experiencing as this legislation goes forward. Representative Sebelia. I just want to make sure I understand what you are talking about. That which, so no definition of water or sewer areas? Yeah, this talks about areas served by water and sewer. Mm -hmm. and, and municipalities adopt sewer service area ordinances or maps or boundaries or policies. And the two are one and the same, as I see it. They're defining where they're serving by water and sewer and where they're not and what their goals are. Um, and I, I think that it's availability of infrastructure is really what this is all about. We wanna use it as efficiently and effectively as possible. And I think just giving that clear authority to a municipality that they're managing their water and sewer service area, not just for the efficiency of the system, and for maintaining you know, public health and clean water, but by furthering their, their community land use and economic development and housing goals. So giving them more say. Yeah, yeah I don't know that it would give them more say than they're already exercising, but it would, it would make very clear that they have the authority to, to exercise that say. It's just, there's a, it's a very vague statute now as it relates to this. Just thinking about this kind of the totality of what we're doing here, because we've taken a lot, we've taken away, say, from the towns and a lot of things. So just... Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, just really quickly, Thanks. section three, uh, uh, I assume Mentor said it well, we do support uh, protecting emergency shelters. Um, the definitions are fine uh, under section four. Under section six, um, we do have a significant concern about change to the appeals process. Um, and when the we testified before the Senate Natural Resources Committee, they were dealing with a proposed language that would have eliminated the right of 10 residents or landowners in a municipality to appeal a zoning board decision, a local zoning decision. Um, we supported that, but what we testified at that time was if you're looking for an alternative, uh, we, would, we would hope that you would look for an alternative. And what we suggested that it be a person with a particularized interest, which is the standard for appeal of an a and r permit or an Act 250 permit. Um, the language that came out of the Senate is, we, we have some concerns about particularized interest is not a defined term in statute. Actually, a, a person aggrieved is, um, we would also encourage the committee to, uh, like Act 250, uh, allow an appeal of a person, not 10 persons with a particularized interest. Um, and that we would suggest the bill is written, says they, that uh, the people with particularized interest can't appeal a 
decision based on character of the area, we would recommend that it be you can't appeal a housing or affordable housing project based on character of the area and not apply that same limitation to quarries and uh, you know more potentially noxious uses in a town. So we have specific language we'll present we will send to the committee this afternoon uh, that makes our suggestions. Um, So I, I do. This is something that just came to my attention late last night. Um, the subdivision provisions under Section Eight, um, the allowing a zoning administrator to approve a subdivision, we believe it happens in minor instances now, um, especially with boundary line adjustments. As some folks brought to my attention, and I'm not, I'm not giving you a recommendation at this time, I'm just raising an issue that I hope you'll hear more about, that the carte blanche allowing the subdivision review process to be administered by a zoning administrator um, really could carve neighbors out of some large scale development project reviews. So I just wanna flag that as something that I wanna look into further, understand how how extensive that authority is because the subdivision review process, I spent maybe 18 years on our development review board, land subdivisions is what we did. And it, it was of great interest to the community. You know, we, I don't think we ever uh, denied any, but we often addressed neighborhood concerns through the review process. And I, I, I want to just flag that as something that is a, only a recent concern that I didn't spend a lot or our staff didn't spend a lot of time thinking about, but I do want to, I think you're going to be hearing about that. Um, so uh, the section nine, um, the appeals clarification, I just want to be clear that this provision that doesn't allow the uh, appeal of a local development review board decision based on their finding that something meets the character of the area has been in statute for a while. That was one of the things that was actually done 20 years ago, I believe. And that that is is fine. And this doesn't change that, but it clarifies it. Um, so it's it's this want to be clear that we understand that and we are fine with it. Um, I want to raise a question about the energy codes. I understand the desire to have consistency across municipal boundaries when it comes to energy codes. As I understand this provision as it's written now, it grandfathers the 10 communities who have more extensive energy codes than the state stretch code. And it allows communities to, um, uh, additional communities to adopt new energy codes provided they go through a charter change. And my question, and this is honestly a question that probably want to hear from the public service department from, does the energy codes include heating sources? Because I know some communities have adopted ordinances to require fossil fuel free heating sources. My understanding of the energy code is it involves insulation and energy efficiency. Um, and I just, I, I raised that as I, we would encourage flexibility for municipalities to uh, allow for development review boards and, and boards of adjustment under their regulations to look at heating sources to wean the state off of fossil fuels for heating our homes and businesses. And um, so I, I'm not sure whether this covers that or not. And one other thought that, um, yeah, sorry, I but that, that's just a, a, a concern. Um, so section 16, does deal with Act 250. Um, the 1055 rule has been around for a long time. I don't know its inception, but it's basically back when 10 units triggered Act 250 in all towns. That was changed when this when the legislature eliminated the 10-acre loophole for septic disposal. Prior to, I think it was 2003, 2004, you didn't need any septic approval from the state if you had a 10 acre or larger lot. That was eliminated and a one acre town at that town became a six lot town. Um, six units triggered Act 250 um, in those communities. And then in the 10 acre town, 10 lots still did. There was a concern in the day that 
developers were getting around that 10 acre threshold by piecemealing projects, doing it incremental. And that at some point, even if 10 houses or more were located on multiple lots, you know, not adjacent to one another, they still could have an impact on community services or a cumulative impact on um, natural resources. This law changes that to 25 units within <laughs> five years in certain designated areas. And, and we are fine with that. It does sunset that provision in three years. And we believe the intent of that was to allow the legislature to get those studies and to make more comprehensive um, overhaul of Act 250 and looking at those locational jurisdiction uh, data that comes from the NRB. Um, likewise, it lifts the cap on priority housing projects in designated centers also with a three-year sunset. So initially when neighborhood development areas were um, created, the cap was different based on the population of the community. I believe, and I'm going by memory, I believe it was 75 for the largest municipalities over 10,000, uh, 50 and 25, and 25 being below 2,500 population. Um, last year, the legislature eliminated the cap on the top communities and went from 50 to 75 in the next tier and 25 to 50 in the smaller communities. And this just eliminates it in those designated areas for that time frame. Now, we're, it does raise some concerns for us, some large scale projects in small towns that might not have the same level of review and likely wouldn't have the same level of review that Act 250 would provide. But we also understand the urgency of the, of the problem and the fact that we're hopefully on the verge of making more significant permanent changes to the law. So um, we're, you know, have, I'd, I'd like to say we don't oppose that change maybe more than we wholeheartedly support it. Um, uh, the master uh, section 16, a, the master permitting um, um, process. I know it's been talked about for years. Master permitting is authorized. It has been used in certain instances, especially around um, industrial parks and ski areas. Uh, Downtowns kind of provide a, a complication to those other examples and that you have a lot of multiple ownership and different <clears throat> landowner objectives, but it, 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 it's worth seeing if it works as far as we're concerned. Um, Section 17B is interesting. Um, one of the changes, that this, what this requires is that, and I'm not reading from the legislation, but that in order to be... Um, designated as an NRB or to have the priority housing project area exemptions in one of the other designated areas, a municip municipality either has to have a wastewater system, a water system, or a alternative system approved by a &R. Last year, when the legislature made changes to the neighborhood development area, it actually eliminated that requirement. And the thinking was some of our village centers might have excellent water sources that aren't a municipal water supply, or really good soils, um, and all of those, all of, all of those facilities, wastewater and water supply, are going to be permitted by ANR. They're going to meet our basic water quality and source protection standards. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a municipal system. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to look to Representative Bongarts because I think he was he drafted that provision last year. This actually removes that <coughs> flexibility and and will make it more difficult for these areas to be designated. I don't believe that was the intent of the Senate. I think those changes happened in some of the last days to try to um, um, make what came out of the Senate Economic Development Committee consistent with the existing law for neighborhood development areas. And in turn, instead of changing that what came out of the Economic Development Committee to comply with the new NRD law, it did the opposite. It changed the neighborhood development area, NDA, sorry, not NRD, um, law by going back to where it was before last year. So our suggestion was eliminate that provision and just allow ANR permitting to do what it does. That makes sense? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, the enhanced designation for village centers, um, we feel is unnecessary. The neighborhood development area provision applies to all designated areas. It applies not only internally to the land within an existing designated area, but also 
in, for example, Village Center, but also to land nearby and adjacent to it. And But it also has a designation process that is really designed to say, are we avoiding some of those features that would otherwise be regulated under Act 250? Um, and does the community have the capacity and the rules in place to promote the type of smart growth, compact, walkable residential development that we're looking for? And we would like to strengthen that program, not provide an easy alternative to it. And we think this provides an easy alternative to it without really adding any value. Um, that, that, that is an area that we'd like to see removed in place of the existing neighborhood development area program. Um, finally, uh, in the bill, the class four road provision, that's to me is just kind of a, a consumer protection provision. People should know what land they're buying and what to expect from the town that they're living, uh, you know, moving into with regard to whether that road is going to be maintained on a year round basis and what the expectation is for them to maintain it. It's really as simple as that. Um, so that that's our, our comment and suggestions. And I, I apologize for not handing out draft language, but I will provide some suggestions very shortly. I do want to comment on the, um, uh, on a proposal that the, Senate rejected, and I understand may be afloat in the House, and that's to take that 25-5-5 rule, that, 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 that rule that says we're going to allow you to build up to 25 units in these designated areas within five years, within five miles, um, and extend that to a townwide um, uh, exemption for those areas, which would effectively say you could have 25 units of housing anywhere in a community regardless of whether it's on a ridgeline, on a river corridor, or prime ag soils. Um, and, and that to me is not an, there's no affordability provision to it. It's just basically business as usual of building large second homes or primary homes scattered in our natural resources rather than concentrating it in the smart growth locations that we're looking for. Um, so we don't feel like Act 250, unfortunately, has been an impediment to scattered residential development out in our natural resources. And this would uh, even make it less of an impediment than it, than it has been. Um, and we've seen, uh, we have presented to this committee a lot of data on forest fragmentation and the impacts that scattered kind of unplanned residential development is having in the countryside. So that's just a, a preemptive comment on a on an amendment that might come before the committee, and we'd be really eager to come back and talk specifically to it if that does happen. And in and, and doing that, I would go into detail about how zoning varies from Act 250 and why it, it, how it continues to play a very important role in nearly every community, not necessarily everyone that has zoning. And one provision of the bill, I think getting to Representative Sevilla, or I'm um, sorry, um, um, Another comment um, is, is there is a provision of the bill that looks at delegation to municipalities. And you know, we are open to that discussion. This, is, this bill does it in a limited way. It does it within, for development within certain designated areas, um, which I don't think satisfied some of the proponents of it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think that should be part of that larger conversation when we talk about the administration of Act 250, locational jurisdiction in our designation programs in more detail. So, but we're, we're don't oppose it moving forward with the bill as is. Um, we question whether it's gonna really provide much benefit to any municipality, but um, we also don't think it will provide have any downside to any resource or any municipality. I, I think that's all I have. Thank you for your testimony. Do members have questions? Um, while you're here, there was a uh, proposed provision that came up for discussion on another committee about this to the effect that a developer could build four houses anywhere many times as the developer wanted to and not be subject to active 15 jurisdiction. Any yeah, you know, our, our, our problem with that is same as the 25 anywhere. It's basically... At, <laughs> You know, at what point is building four units every three months for five years add up to an impact? Um, I, I don't know where the number four came from. I, I haven't talked to the 
anybody who has proposed that. I wonder if it's this, what this bill would do is say a fourplex is allowed where you have water and sewer service area. Um, the increasing the cap on PP on priority housing projects maybe accomplishes the same thing, but we would oppose anything that just allows unlimited incremental development over an extended time without some review. And that would do it, as I understand it, without any review necessarily even, I don't know if it would involve local zoning or not, but it's certainly not uh, location specific. It doesn't deal with the impact that that cumulative development could have on a whole host of natural resources or on community services and facilities. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Thank you. Um, members, we're gonna take a Five minute break, we come back at 10 past. Right, we're going to reconvene our meeting, continue thinking about S100 with Sarah Phillips. Yeah, she's still in the room on Zoom. All right, are you, are you ready for me? We are ready for you. Great. Okay. I'm Sarah Phillips. I'm the director of the State Office of Economic Opportunity in the Department for Children and Families in the Agency of Human Services. And as I understand it, I'm speaking today with you about the small portion of the bill that has to do with um, uh, zoning and emergency shelters. Um, so I have some slides I can just quickly go through to provide some context and then Happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, share screen. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So um, knowing that I'm, I'm not often in front of your community, but wanted to provide just some overview of, of sort of what emergency shelter looks like in Vermont, I think that's important to understand. Uh, so we have about 28 emergency shelters in Vermont. They vary in terms of the model. This is Upper Valley Havens um, in the Hartford area. This is one of their shelters. Shelters are both congregate and semi-congregate facilities. Uh, this includes domestic and sexual violence shelters. We also have a number of seasonal warming shelters. All of them by design are intended to be temporary and to help guests move into permanent housing as quickly as possible. Um, this is Lamoille Community House in, um, in Hyde Park. Shelters uh, don't solve homelessness. We're very clear about that in our field, but they keep people from being unsheltered and they're a really critical part of, of uh, the safety net in Vermont. They're really about connecting people to resources and services and supporting them on their journey. This is at the Bennington Co County Coalition for the Homeless on Main Street in Bennington. Uh, right now, um, 20 January, well, this is January 2023, it hasn't changed much for April. Um, we have about capacity to serve about a little over 500 households in emergency shelter across the state. Uh, 32 of those beds are seasonal only. Um, some of them are just winding down right about now, actually closing for the season. In January 2020, right, our pre-COVID data, just for some context, we could serve about 562 households statewide but um, a huge portion of that was just seasonal capacity. And then of course, in May, 2020, you can see the impact of the pandemic, how much capacity we kind of quickly lost during the height of the pandemic. Um, when our emergency shelters are full, just to be really clear, um, that's when, uh, and, and there's no appropriate emergency shelter bed in a community, that's when we put people um, up in emergency housing through a motel stay, right? So it's um, shelter first and then overflow into hotels. And right now there's about 2,400 households experiencing homelessness in Vermont. Um, you can see that our emergency shelters represent our housing about um, a fifth of that population. Over half of the households who are homeless are in hotel, or I'm sorry, three quarters of the households who are homeless are in motels right now. Um, and we do still have some folks who are unsheltered. So we're doing a lot to really preserve and expand emergency shelter because you can see from the last slide that we just don't have enough capacity across the state to meet the needs. Uh, and we're doing a lot to help um, renovate existing facilities as well. So it's not just about expanding what we, the capacity, it's about preserving it as well. The pandemic's really pushed us to think differently about shelter in the state of Vermont. Um, and we've moved towards less congregate settings. 
Um, one of the barriers though around shelters is um, their ability to operate 24 seven. We actually have some zoning restrictions in the in the state of Vermont that prohibit the ability for shelters to operate 24 seven. Oh, and say uh, that's the picture of uh, in Berlin, the Welcome Center operated with goods. Uh, the reality is we've actually have nine new shelter sites that um, have stood up around the state. We, and when I say we, I mean the collective we. Uh, I'll speak to that in a moment. DCF doesn't go around and um, take over land and stand up shelters. Um, this is the collective we. But nine new sites between 2020 and 2022. I want to be really clear, this is an equity issue. Families and communities are both better off when people experiencing a housing crisis can stay near their jobs their schools, their doctors, their family and friends and other services. And we have a lot of communities in Vermont where we don't have enough capacity. And the impact is that families and individuals have to be housed two, sometimes three counties away from where their communities are. That's disruptive to communities in Vermont. It doesn't just impact those families negatively. And I just wanna lift that up is that when we cannot place shelters in the areas where we need them, that's really problematic. So here's the reality. Shelters develop out of local partnerships, right? Um, the community comes together. They understand and identify gaps. They work to right-size shelter capacity to follow best practices and to expand capacity. This is Tim's house in downtown St. Albans. The state, state role in shelters is to provide planning support, data analysis. We provide a lot of technical assistance on best practices, and we make sure that our providers understand the funding requirements, but we're really there to partner. There are a lot of examples in this state. Um, I've been in this work for a long time now um, where yeah. communities have come together uh, based on identified, clearly defined needs and have not been able to site a shelter due to um, restrictions in the local communities. I just wanna, this is, uh, this is a Main Street shelter operated by COTS for families in Chinon County. You can get a sense of the variety of shelter models. I think uh, the reality is, again, we don't think that we can solve homelessness with emergency shelters. We solve homelessness with housing and the other aspects of this bill are really important to address our housing crisis. Um, the shelter field and community and DCF, we're responding to a housing crisis. Fundamentally, we just need much, much more affordable housing in the state of Vermont. The length of time people experience homelessness in the state has more than tripled in the past four years. It's because there's no housing. I think Sue spelled, spoke very eloquently to that. Um, just to highlight the section of the bill that does seek to address the issue of siting of emergency shelters. And then I'll just, um, I can stop sharing for a moment. And uh, let me see. Happy to answer any questions, but I think more to the point, I just want to be really clear that there are, um, it takes years and there are some communities where they've been working more than years to site shelters. I want to name things like character of the neighborhood as specific reasons why there's an unwillingness to site shelter. This is nimbyism beyond what's experienced with affordable housing in the state of Vermont character of the neighborhood was cited as a reason that they would not allow for an expansion of shelter on an existing shelter site in Hartford, Vermont. I think it's just really problematic and I wanna lift it up. I, I appreciate that um, this language is um, still in the bill and moving forward and just wanna highlight the importance of it moving forward. So happy to answer any other questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I have a question. I don't know that I understand exactly the restriction on 24 hour, uh, seven day a week on a shelter that's housing homeless people. What, what would close? How could it close? Maybe I don't understand your question, sorry. <laughs> How could the shelter close during the day? Is, is that what it means? It closes during the day? Yeah, that's what it means. It says that, and the reality is people need shelter, not just overnight but during the daytime hours but yeah, yeah we have not, restrictions placed understand. on shelters that yeah that says that they can only provide evening shelter which means that folks need to exit in the morning and aren't allowed to come back until the evening and that's a that's done through zoning that restriction through 
permitting processes. Yes, conditional use, perhaps. I'd have to, I could. I'd have to look into the specific examples, but yes, that is one example that absolutely happens. And it places the burden of uh, fighting for the right to operate on the shelter provider specifically, who's day in, day out trying to meet the basic needs of some um, vulnerable Vermonters. And I, I think we just need to address that issue fundamentally. Can you give a number to the amount of shelters that haven't been able to be open that folks wanted to open? Um, number, I think that's hard. Um, I think, you know, our, sh our emergency shelter operators would be best positioned to tell their own stories. Um, I can speak to, you know, current projects in development. I think in Lamoille, I shared a picture of Lamoille Community House. That's at a site that operates only seasonally um, because they aren't allowed to op operate year round. They um, have been working over the past three years to identify, three years to identify a site um, and uh, that they can be able to operate year round, um, expand capacity. I think that are set to hopefully open this fall with um, capacity to serve 20, 16 or 20 individuals. Um, and they have some funding from VHCB, but they looked at um, dozens of possible sites in Lamoille County. Um, they're definitely facing opposition in the site that they've identified now. And I, I'm not sure if they're still in the appeals process, but that's an example of one community. Um, uh, three years to, to try to stand up that capacity in St. Johnsbury. Um, essentially, the shelter has been right, um, relegated to the part of town that is in the healthcare district, um, where there's very little, it's, not, it's outside of the main part of town where people would need to access other services and supports. Um, there's very little uh, developable land within that area. Um, they uh, have been searching for, uh, they had operated a seasonal site at a shelter um, that at, at, at a site owned by the hospital, a hospital property prior to COVID that closed down. They've been looking for another site to be able to operate a shelter for adults in St. Johnsbury. Um, again, they're restricted to that part of the, um, also the seasonal shelter was not allowed to op operate during the daytime hours, but they, um, thankfully they have a project they're hoping to move forward with, um, with some funding this fall. That's, I mean, that's been several, several years. I mean, those are just two examples in Hartford. They've wanted to expand capacity at the Upper Valley Haven campus to provide seasonal capacity for adults, uh, during the coldest months of the year, um, that, that project didn't move forward, was blocked um, through the zoning process. So, I mean, those are just some very specific examples just within the past few years and um, and Bennington as well and their siting of their shelters. Um, it's been a challenge as they seek to preserve capacity as they've lost some capacity and have tried to stand up others. Um, I mean, every area of the state, this is an issue. <laughs> so. Those are just some specific examples. Thank you. That that's a good answer for my question. Do members have questions? Representative Bonger. Oh. Um, Representative Logan has a question. Oh, thanks. There's, Sorry. There's no raise on the train. So she has written it. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Kate's going to read a question um, from our representative, who's also named Kate. Our committee assistant will read the question. Um, so she asked, "How many homeless ha households currently shelter in hotels while waiting for?" housing and are expected to potentially lose their hotel shelter in the coming year? Yeah, that's um, that's a good question, right? So there are changes to general assistance emergency housing um, program administered by the Department of Children and Families that are coming during the current year. Um, there's changes that will be happening on June 1st and then changes that presumably will be happening on July 1st. I will say what happens in state fiscal year 24 is still under discussion in the legislature. 
Um, I don't, OEO doesn't administer the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program. It is several hundred households that will no longer be eligible in June, uh, but I, I don't have more specific for that program. Some of those households will exit into um, shelter capacity to the extent that it's available. Generally, our shelters are operating at near 100% capacity most nights. Um, so that's I, I can follow up with some more specific data points uh, for Kate or the committee if, if helpful. Thank you. Sue, Sue Minter says I think Sue Minter, yeah. that's what you, oh, Representative Morris noted that it was in Sue Minter's written testimony. Okay. Thank you again for your testimony. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for um, your due diligence on this bill. Next up, we have Jay Green. Welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the Office of Racial Equity. Um, my name is Jay Green. I use they, them pronouns, and I am uh, the policy and research analyst for the office. Um, I uh, Wanted to focus in. Um, so the the mission of the let me just get my get my notes ready again here. Sure. Um, so the mission of the Office of Racial Equity is to uh, work on dismantling systems of systemic racism that may exist throughout the state government, including the legislature. So um, I wanted to take this opportunity to point out um, an instance where there are racial disparities created by the statutory language. Um, and that is specifically, um, if you look under section six, uh, that's 24 BSA 4465, um, appeals of the decisions of the administrative officer. Um, I apologize that I don't have a page note. Um, I just memorized the bill, that's good work. Um, yes, so um, so this refers to um, this language refers to um, who is allowed to appeal decisions of the administrative board. Um, and um, so so an interested person, according to the Subsection B1 is a person owning title to property, uh, municipal or solid waste management district, et cetera. Um, but then if you go down to uh, section four, um, the, I'm not actually talking about what has been added in this bill, um, any 10 persons who allege a common injury to a particular interest. I, I'm specifically referring to um, uh, who may be any combination of voters or real property owners within a municipality listed in subdivision two of this subsection. So the, the sticky wicket there is um, voters and real property owners because um, Vermont has um, serious racial disparities in the um, property ownership department. Um, the 2021 American Community Survey five-year estimate found that um, 73% of white Vermonters own their home, compared to only 26% of Vermont residents who identified as uh, Black or African American alone. Um, and other people of color in Vermont also report, uh, report lower home ownership rates than white people in Vermont. So um, restricting the appeals process to only voters and real property owners is going to have a racially disparate impact um, on people of color in Vermont. Um, so I spoke with executive director of racial equity, Susanna Davis, about this, and she said that she's in favor of keeping the appeals process because we do want people to have the opportunity to, um, to make comments on, uh, on the review process, but, um, the, the office, uh, strongly feels that, um, there needs to be a change to that language of, about voters and real property owners because um, 
voters also is um, disproportionately exclusive of people of color in Vermont because um, people like, for example, people who have a green card. Um, so they're lawful permanent residents, but they still don't have the ability to vote. So they may live in Vermont, but they don't have a voting rights. So they could, so you could be a green card. You could have a green card, but and be a resident of a town that's planning a development and want to, if you <coughs> not be able to, because you're not a voter. Um, yeah, and that also excludes um, people who are undocumented. So um, there's a couple of, of issues there. I did note that um, under section 19 on uh, page 31, line 19, um, there's a different definition of an interested person, um, which is um, a person owning title to or occupying property within or abutting the designated area. So um, I wanted to highlight that as a possible remedy um, that occupying property might be something that's a little bit more inclusive that could help um, that could help to broaden who can who can make an appeal um, to include more people who potentially don't own property uh, in Vermont. Um, and then um, other than that, um, and I'm happy to submit these comments in writing, as you can see, I have a, a draft before me that is not quite finished yet. Um, I uh, there is kind of an outstanding question there about um, what does it mean to just occupy property? How long does someone need to be occupying that property to, to make an appeal, for example, and how much you know, proof is sufficient to prove that someone is occupying a property? Um, so that might be something for the legislature to consider defining further um, what it means to occupy a property and, and how long someone needs to be there to do that. Um, and what proof do they need to provide in, in order to go through the appeals process? But um, so um, other, than, other than that, I wanted to um, comment on um, several uh, appropriations and sections that have been re-added to the current draft of this bill that is before the committee today that were stripped from the version as passed by, Senate, by the Senate, I believe, that um, the office supports. Um, we want to encourage the office, encourages the committee to retain um, section 27 of this bill, which includes a, um, a fiscal year 24 general fund appropriation to the Vermont Human Rights Commission to create a new full-time exempt uh, housing discrimination litigator position. Um, the Office of Racial Equity works very closely with the Human Rights Commission, and we want to support our colleagues ask for a uh, new um, housing discrimination litigator because as, as we expand, hopefully, the amount of housing in Vermont, we want to make sure that people are protected from uh, discriminatory uh, renting, renting and uh, practices in general related to housing. Um, we also wanted to specifically highlight our support for um, the funding allocations to the Vermont Housing Finance Agency for the first generation home buyer program. <laughs> that program was created under Act 182 of 2022 and we're encouraged to see it continue to be funded for another fiscal year. Um, there have been some other programs that um, the legislature has funded for one year only that are related to diversity and equity. And we wanted to <coughs> highlight that this is a good opportunity to prove your investment in um, diversity and equity through the uh, funding allocations process. Um, the, there's also section 36, the middle income homeowners development program and section 38, the rental housing revolving loan program. So um, wanted to express the office of racial equity support for these programs that are specifically dedicated to um, uplifting the and empowering people in low and middle income communities to purchase homes or uh, be, um, uh, resist being evicted. Um, so yeah, that, that, is the, um, that is the total of, of the testimony on behalf of the office, but I'm happy to take any further questions if <clears throat> um, anybody is interested to, in asking. Thank you for your testimony. Do Thank you very much. Do members have questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, well, we have about half an hour until the next witness is scheduled. Uh, Commissioner Hanford, would you want to testify? You would have maybe a little less. I mean, we could, well, we could give you half an hour still if you're available now. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Question. Okay. Twice. Bless you. <laughs> Quick, I was just going to say. 
Welcome. Thank you. For the record, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Development. And I was kind of invited a little bit last minute today, so I don't have written testimony um, and not going to um, line by line, just more big picture sort of um, champion this, this bill and, and talk about the administration's perspective uh, in the big picture. Happy to answer any questions um, along the way, though, at any point. Um, just want to give a little bit of background about myself because I, I don't think I'm in here very often. It's not usually where we talk a lot about a, house, a lot of housing and community development work. But um, as Chair Sheldon knows, we um, worked on uh, natural resource stuff 20 years ago uh, in the White River Valley and worked on repairing buffers and water quality testing and all, all kinds of stuff. And sort of my first 10 years in Vermont was more about um, natural resource and, and um, rural economic development sort of work. And as um, my career sort of moved on, I became more and more involved in housing development, affordable housing funding, policy work um, with uh, federal funds from Department of Housing and Urban Development, and then all of our housing partners here in Vermont, and then working with uh, practically every community in the state. Um, as the community development director, uh, Vermont community development director for 10 years, um, providing uh, federal grants to address the community development needs of these communities. And the theme kept marching on, housing, 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 affordable housing, not enough housing is being built. Um, <clears throat> moved along my career and, and was appointed deputy commissioner under Governor Shumlin. Um, and that carried on under Governor Scott. We had the large uh, housing for all revenue bond, which sort of was the biggest investment at the time, ended up being about $37 million. Um, that soon uh, was very clear that that was just a drop in the bucket of the need. Um, and then in 2019, uh, became the commissioner of housing and uh, community development. And um, then, you know, March 2020 rolled around and sort of the, the, um, pandemic really highlighted just how a dire our housing situation was. And that if you looked at the data for the last four decades, really, we've been underbuilding um, by, by quite a bit. Um, if you look at the last decade alone, the data is somewhere around our net housing growth was 0.18%, meaning we we're barely adding any new housing stock. When you consider um, what was being lost from, from our housing due to, you know, just falling apart, it's not available anymore, conversion to something else, and then the net new housing. And that was all housing. Um, and so you can really see this drop off from the early <clears throat> 80s to where we are now. Um, Can you say that number one more time? 0.18% uh, of growth in housing stock for the last decade. So, uh, for that was for the whole decade. That was the total net growth. So each year, you know, you can summarize this in um, residential building permits. Back in the '80s, they were close to 5,000 permits a year. In the last decade, it's been under 2,000 a year, more like 1,300 a year. And so you could just see the drop. Um, and there's a lot of factors out there, but one thing we, you know, had heard repeatedly over and over again is, well, we don't have enough uh, housing money going into the system. Well, I think the last five years have, has changed that. We've seen almost a half a billion dollars into the affordable housing uh, development, and some of that money is still available. The HCV has resources they're still uh, making available. We have some resources for the VHIP program from my housing improvement program, which is a smaller up to $50,000 grant loan to match with uh, private owners to bring housing stock back online, uh, essentially um, uh, existing housing stock that has fallen in disrepair, is vacant, is abandoned. It's, it, it needs some upkeep and reinvestment because during our years, we do a housing needs assessment every five years to maintain our federal funding. And the last uh, needs assessment showed that Vermont had almost 19,000 housing units that were substandard. So we figured the best solution here, the lowest hanging fruit was design a program to reutilize an existing housing stock. Um, meets a lot of goals from a lot of folks. There's a lot of um, opportunity out there. 
Um, and it, it's been very successful. I, I would argue we needed this 10, 15 years ago to not end up in the, the situation we're in. Um, but that doesn't work everywhere in the state. You have some parts of the state where they need net new units and they needed them yesterday. Um, you can't just repurpose uh, or bring back online units that have fallen into disrepair. Um, and so a variety of, uh, of solutions to address the housing needs through resources, through new money. Um, but with the rising costs of everything from labor to materials to supply shortages, and yes, regulations, zoning, Act 250 um, has become um, the area that government can control the most. We can control global supply of <clears throat> X widget that goes into housing construction. We can't control labor costs. In fact, you know, I think we're benefiting from people receiving some higher wages. Um, but we can control the cost of development on the side of, of regulatory framework. And you know, there's national numbers from the uh, National Home Builders and Remodelers Association that say about 25% of the cost of building a new home is embedded in regulations. You often hear it as the four or five L's, you know, lumber, um, land, labor, and laws, they call it. Um, it you know, it, it laws being the regulatory framework. So sort of in my career of working in uh, natural resource work, conservation, uh, community development, and housing work, I've sort of seen this, this shift in my thinking and, and, and beliefs really that we have done a better job in Vermont um, of ensuring we value our natural resources, protect them, uh, maybe above our housing goals and our housing needs. Um, you know, I think that there's often um, communities all often have conservation commissions much more before they have a housing commission. They often have all these other councils and efforts and they housing is just supposed to be left up to the free market, right? You know, someone builds a house for you, you <clears throat> pay for it to rent or buy and it solves itself. Well, it's not. I mean, the market is really broken in a lot of ways. Uh, it costs a lot more to build a home than the working class family can afford. Um, we have unique programs in S100 and, and started last year to subsidize that, that cost of development versus what a median income family can afford. But it's still the government interventions on paying the subsidy and to pay for the broken market it is not going to get us out of this um, situation. We need to address some of these regulatory uh, issues. I was just reading over here uh, a new article from Pew Trust that um, uh, did a study on four locations, Minneapolis, New, New Rochelle, New York, Portland, Oregon, and Tyson's, Virginia. They've all had substantial um, upzoning and deregulation of housing development in those communities, you know, where, and they have studied and found where they remove barriers to where you can build a home and how many they've seen a, um, a de-escalation in rent um, between only one and 7%, whereas the same period, the national average increase in rent is 30%. Um, I'm happy to share this, but this is just one data point of many that yes, more supply does work. It actually does bring down the cost to people. Um, and you know, some of the other testimony I heard, heard and has heard throughout this sort of argument and debate about does local zoning, does Act 250 have impact on housing? And if we just allow more housing to be built anywhere, isn't it just gonna go to second home or, or those various arguments? Um, you know, I, I'd just like to mention a couple things on that point that um, I think our existing um, regulatory framework, both local zoning and Act 250 has worked very well for second homeowners. Um, there's nothing that, that, in my experience, they enjoy more than less dense housing that's spread out um, and that reduces the economies of scales of building 25 versus nine or 10 units. Um, you know, we have the second highest uh, rate of second homes in the nation, only behind Maine and New Hampshire's third. Um, some folks will point to short-term rentals, you know, as, as in having an impact here. It has an impact, but I would argue that um, they only represent 3% of our housing stock, and half of that is in existing vacation homes. So it's really impacting 1.5% compared to 17% of our housing being owned by second homeowners. And that's been um, 
a tradition here for over a century, really, if you look at northern New England being uh, a place where folks had second homes. And so some of what this bill and, and, and amendments that, that have been floating around are trying to do is open that stock, build more, um, and that the density and that the economies of scale of building more housing and more places will, will help and will be available to lower incomes. Um, the compromises that have been reached in the, the Senate at passing out of Senate Natural Resources to allow some of this increased Act 250 thresholds um, in the designated areas is great. It, it's just, I think there needs to be some level setting here that all those designated areas combined in the entire state added up is 0.3% of the land area. Um, it's not enough. I think that we often think our designated areas are what we think are our, our built environment in our downtown. They're not. You can be on this side of the street and you're in a designated area and on this side you're not because they weren't designed with the exception of the neighborhood development area, the newest one that's only been around for a couple of years. They were not designed to allow housing development. They were designed for commercial and civic cores to allow historic tax credits to fix up those buildings and other goals. Um, it's been used as a prax proxy of places we agree that are smart growth, but there simply is not enough area in those areas to, uh, to adequately, adequately build the housing we need, let alone with an equity lens that all the new housing we're gonna allow to be built is in the most dense part of the state and it's gonna be apartments because that's all the room for. And we shouldn't allow um, other housing types and choice across the state. You know, even Burlington, largest city in the state, their total designated areas in the whole city of Burlington, all three of them that they have, only add up to 14% of Burlington's area. Yet 40% of Burlington's land mass has some sort of permanent conservation land. So they literally have more land permanently conserved than land that is in a designation sort of um, uh, with some easier passes to development. Um, and I, if you looked at across the communities that in the designations we have, you would find a very similar um, situation. So I just think we need to be real with ourselves that that 0.3% of our land area, we're gonna struggle to try to provide the housing we need for all the types of people that need housing. And the frustration I, I see and express um, when I'm, uh, I'm in committees, whether it's in the legislature or at town, uh, it, it's a speaking to town officials is the sort of debate around, well, it's okay to build this housing here and this type of housing can be here and we're okay seeing people live here. And you're, you're talking about where people are going to sleep at night. You're talking about people's homes. And if we see it on this hillside, it might be ugly and we would oppose that. I, I think that we're fooling ourselves if we're not gonna be okay um, with seeing more housing to solve this problem. And um, I understand we have, um, you know, long traditions I support of, of keeping rural working lands and historic settlement patterns, but we also have historic settlement patterns that even those historic settlement patterns do not have the ability to build the housing we need because those historic settlement paddles aren't encompassed in these designation areas. They're bigger than those. And we don't have a path to get there quickly uh, with the compromises that have been made as the bill exited Senate Natural Resources to uh, address the housing we need, in my opinion. Um, it, you know, we still have this exclusive exclusionary um, development pattern in Vermont that if you can afford enough to purchase five, 10 acres, you can have your housing needs met. But if you can't afford that, we're gonna to try to fit you in an apartment building that some affordable housing developer is gonna build for you with 100% public funding. And that's been our solution to addressing the housing problem. And I, I think we need to be a little bit more realistic around knocking down barriers, trying to help the market work better, Yes, guiding to the least impactful places on our that we have concerns about impacts to our natural resources, but there's going to be a little give and, and take um, in, in this work. So I, I'm happy to you know answer questions. I just wanted to speak broadly about this, and 
you know, th there's references when, when we hear debates about um, Act 250 in particular doesn't add any cost or time. That that is just roundly rejected from from my view. We have a study that the legislature asked us to do six years ago. It's old. The costs are higher than they were then. It's called the Act 50, uh, 157 study that uh, showed it typically added six months to a housing development and um, tens of thousands of dollars, depending on how big it was. Forget that the Act 250 fee, just the application fee alone, is a is a cost based application. And it went up during this time by 25% of what it was when that study was done. And so if an average housing unit is costing about $500,000 to build now, even an apartment, and you're doing a 10-unit development, the fee alone is close to $75,000, not to mention all the other permits that you're going to need to get along the way and the time. And if you go into the next construction season, time is money, development, you know, pressures, are real and these costs add up um, and folks can easily avoid that. Just stay under nine units and build nine big homes that aren't gonna be available for folks that um, are moderate, lower income and you don't have to take that risk and add that added cost. I think it's not getting us the type of development we actually want and serving the type of people we <clears throat> serve in Vermont. And, um, we can't keep doing the same thing and expect it to change because this problem has been growing for 40 years. So. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm interested in the Pew study that you referenced. Yep. And um, also if you, uh, it seems, I mean, it'd be, I'd be interested if you have specific language that you're at. Um, I will send you that study. Um, I can send the Act 157 report. And um, my team um, at the department has some small technical changes. I think I've been working with a few folks on here um, just to help make some of the provisions that we all support work a little bit better. I know things are moving very fast. Um, I believe that the compromise that I've heard that maybe the rural caucus is proposing would add a little bit more to this Act 250 sort of relief valve that I think is needed was still uh, uh, this window. You know, I, I think the, administ the administration's view is we actually aren't doing enough in this bill, Act 250, but this has been a broad compromise, a broad coalition to try to work around things. Not everyone is getting what they want. There's parts of this bill that the administration is absolutely not really in support of, but we're sort of biting our lip because we're getting this and that. Um, and then in the whole, this is good for housing. Um, and so the... The rural caucus um, sort of amendments that are floating out there, I don't know if anything's official yet, based on what the, happened in the Senate by Senator Chittenden, it's a building upon that, adds a little bit more uh, Act 250 um, deregulation for communities that have permanent planning and zoning um, for a period of time while these studies happen, um, I think is the direction that I, I would urge the committee to consider, um, think about really what kind of what kind of developments are going to be able to take place in that period? You know, who is like, are we really going to change the state in these three years, or are we going to learn something and maybe relieve some of this um, very concerning um, with with still having twenty five hundred households that are homeless at this point in time and having another two years of extraordinary federal money to build affordable housing that will often be targeted at all of these priority areas. I mean, that, that is where we target these funds. And there's no um, benefits in those areas that aren't, um, I'm not being very clear here. All of the funding that we use, public funding to support housing development has these principles of putting it in smart growth locations. They're all the funders prioritize and that's where we try to build this housing. So the relief you're giving outside of those areas we're, we're not going to be um, targeting folks, um, that building in the, those areas. You know, I still think the majority of this three-year sort of pause, if you will, um, while we study, is going to happen in the places we want it to happen the, the most. That was a very no, that was way to summarize. I, I have just a couple more maybe, but, um, and I, this is uh, just a curiosity if you could, I'm back to the un- um, kind of substandard houses, inventory. I, I've been thinking about 
the multifaceted causes of the situation we find ourselves in. And I really do appreciate that work. Um, and I'm also wondering about unintended consequences of other programs. Like uh, there are a lot of empty houses around neighborhoods. People talk about them. They're not necessarily substandard, but they're just not being used at all. <laughs> And in one instance that I know of anyway, it just came to my attention that like there's someone in a nursing home and Medicaid somehow is involved in restricting the use of that home. So I don't know how, where I would get to, who would I ask that question to? Interesting. I mean, um, uh, we, we do see homes that, you know, are bank owned. There's some um, ownership structure that's hard to find uh, the owner to, to try to get something to happen in it. I, I know, um, Representative Woods on the housing committee has one on the end of her street that she's literally personally for 10 years been trying to have something done about. Um, and, the, and the city of Rutland is being much more aggressive of eminent domain, taking property that people aren't settling up on taxes. It's been vacant and they're um, selling them to developers with a, a year. You have a year to redevelopment and put it in use in order to um, sort of uh, move this along and get a deal from the city. I think there, there's creative more creativity that could be done around that. Um, but it's, it's hard. I can walk my neighborhood and see a home or two that is vacant. No one being used, it's not being used. And it's not like it's a second home where there's a, it's just literally just sitting there. Um, everyone I talk to says that Yeah, I can say the same thing. There, yeah. There's just empty houses. Yeah. I can tell you that this VHIP program, um, we're <laughs> at about, so 408 back in January, the data I just saw is another like 215 on top of that 408 that are coming online. And these are all properties that um, were um, vacant um, for whatever reason. Most of the time it was, they were in such poor condition. They couldn't possibly be habitable in code. Um, sometimes it's not as bad as you think you open a wall and they have old tube and knob wire. And that's a 30,000 job for a whole, you know, big Victorian. That's a two, two, uh, you know, two two bedroom apartments to fix um but other times it's been a conversion of a you know a general store that's gone out of business long ago but it could be a couple apartments and and it has to be existing properties right now and i think incentives go a long way to have people come to the table um but you're right there are weird situations of it's an estate-owned property the bank owns it and you just can't get control of it um and I wish I had an answer. I think the answer is promote these incentives, have them ongoing and, and try to make people aware of them. Um, the ADUs is another accessory dwelling units that we're using VHIP for. We're seeing a big uptick of that. And these are ones that are permanent. They're not going for short-term rental because we have conditions on them. It's recorded in the land records. There's a covenant on them. When they, the property changes hands, they have to you know, um, sign off from us and, and it goes to the new owner, their conditions. And so... It's a way to address these concerns of, of short-term rentals, second homeowners, um, holding, take, taking this low-hanging fruit and turning it into investment property. Come on. We can't stop that. What we can do is provide incentives for folks to serve uh, folks that live here by helping to sort of partner with them on covering some of those costs because the rents are going to be affordable. So they're not going to be able to you know, go to the bank, borrow a bunch of money, jack the rents up to two or $3,000 and make that back. We're partnering with them. They're keeping the rents at, you know, most cases it's $900 or below, maybe $1,000 or below, but it's a nice new apartment and it's got a 10 year affordability for 10% um, of what it costs to build new through the traditional affordable housing system, as, as well as revitalized neighborhoods. Grand list goes up. The neighbor's happy that that house is repurposed and looks good. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that that is a ongoing strategy that we, we have to continue to support. One, one more from me, and then I know there's others, but um, 500 million into housing in the last five years. What can we expect from that? Yeah, so the estimates early on, and this has sort of been building. Um, it didn't start out as 500 million. Um, and our goal was uh, 5,000 net new units. When uh, the first year of the pandemic, we were starting to build this out and um, the, the three main housing funders, uh, the HFA, Vermont Housing Finance, the HC, HCB, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and us sort of mapped out what we could bring in, all the resources, what we could build. After about a year and a half, that goal quickly dropped to about 4,000 units. 
We've seen housing costs um, bet rise between 30 and 40 percent, the cost of construction year over year during this period. We're just not going to have enough money to build numbers as we walk through and need to. Um, you know, the VHIP program at, at the average cost is about <laughs> 6,000 per unit we're bringing online. The most recent um, low income housing tax credit, I'm on the VHFA board that we just um, reviewed the other day. The average cost for an 800 square foot apartment is about $450,000 per unit now. So um, the costs are out of control. Yeah. Um, um, Representative Clifford, then Sabina. I'm good. Okay. Representative Sabina. To my question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your testimony. Um, so I am interested in how we can kind of keep track of what is being built. Mm -hmm. So is that something that the administration is kind of thinking about in terms of how many units, where the units are being built? Yeah, so there's this housing recovery group, which is um, those three organizations plus Vermont State Housing Authority, which issues the rental vouchers and those Section 8 vouchers that uh, Sue Minter talked about, which used to be viewed as like your ticket to getting out of poverty because 70% of your rent was going to be paid forever, so long as you qualified. That now 80% of those are being turned to DC because we people can't find housing to use them. But um, that group was has been. Can you say that again? Um, the Section 8 housing vouchers, yeah. which is a federal rental assistance. They can't find which They can't find an apartment. The voucher on. Right. And you only have a certain period of time before the voucher has to be returned. And so it's gotten worse. I mean, you know, a year ago, we were complaining that it was 50 or 60, only 50 or 60 percent success rate. Now it's a 20 percent success rate. Um, you know, anyone that has um, been able to, you know, take opportunity of our housing crisis and then, you know, come in and, and buy some of this property, invest, they're not renting to folks with Section 8 vouchers. Um, so, and, and the rents have been jacked up that maybe are above that voucher rate. And so um, it's becoming harder and harder. And just, there's no moving going on. It, the moving rates, I forget what the stat was, but it's something like the, the number of moves in Vermont is reduced by like 80% in the last few years. So people are stuck and they're not leaving their housing because they know they won't find any more. Um, but the original question, yes, we're, we, we've done that informally as part of this group to try to keep track of um, how many we're building with this money and how many are dedicated to those exiting homelessness. Because we've had a commitment that um, at least 30 percent of all affordable housing we build is going to be reserved for folks exiting homelessness. Under the VHIP program, we've been doing 70 percent so far. Um, and uh, with our affordable housing partners at VHBA and VHCB, They've been um, those larger developments have been reserving 30 percent of the units. So we're keeping track for that to try to like as these programs wind down, see if we'll be successful in, in housing folks. You know, unfortunately, we've rehoused 2,800 homeless families, but there's 2,800 more now in the system. So we can't match those those up. Um, that, that's the hard reality. But there's an annual report we do called the Housing um, Budget and Investment Report. <laughs> that we submit to the legislature every year, which adds up um, what has been invested in uh, housing development from federal, state, and other sources, as well as the social service investments through HS, the rental assistance, the homeless shelters. So we already have the, the inputs of the dollars into the program. What's really hard to do on the number side is, are you counting each year the number of apartment, the number of units you supported that have yet been built, or do you want to count the number of units that came on that one year? Because you could fund in one year and the investments actually don't benefit anyone to three or four years down the road, because that's how long it takes. And so I think that the, the challenge, not that it can't be done, it's just, you know, my vision would be do both. Here's what each year we combined invested in unduplicated count because you have a lot of duplication in these numbers. You know, one agency says here's because that's what they funded. But the reality is when you add them all up and you sort out the duplication, there's one set of total housing investments in one year, and then another set of how many units were completed in one year, which were probably a combination of funding over the last five years that just happened to be completed in one year. So it gets very, the numbers get very um, confusing very fast. Thank you. Representative Clifford. I do have a question. Thank you. Very, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for testifying. Yeah. Um, 
there was supposed to be a plan that was due the 15th of April, a couple days ago. That was, uh, I remember, discussed in January regarding the voucher program and the, uh, the hotel voucher program. Um, if there is, I'm not on that, that I committee. Remember, I, I, well, no, I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember it was being addressed yeah. in the meeting at the pavilion yeah. about that. And they said there was going to be a study or a, or a plan as to where you go, where we go forward. Right. And it was supposed to be due on the 15th of April. I will check. I mean, I, I the, um, the hard facts are, um, there are still people that are in these motel and hotel programs. Yeah. yeah. And there are programs that are winding down and there's three times as many how as many affordable housing units coming online than there ever was before with more reserve for folks that are exiting homelessness but there's still a gap <clears throat> um and i i'm not sure exactly which report that is because there's been about three or four different studies or plans that have had the basic charge of show us how you're going to solve the homeless problem and you get to the end of that period and then it's like well it hasn't been solved so do another plan to solve. And it comes back to, to the two or three legs of the stool, th three legs, but the number one is supply. There isn't enough supply of housing. Number two is you need rental assistance vouchers, which we have more of than we ever had. And they're being sent back because there isn't supply. And then the other is supports and services. So folks that um, are, are in need of that can be successfully housed. And there's more money than ever for that. But those agencies in that capacity is stretched so thin that that is um struggling at this this point as well i know i get all that i just remember that sort yeah. of that date that's, that's what i was curious about. i'll look into that thank you thank you for your testimony okay thanks great what any more questions or yeah. more? oh I'll represent sorry thanks that's okay thank you do, do we know how much of the recent increases in housing costs to build the building costs how much those of how much of that increase is caused by the tremendous amounts of money that we're actually putting into building that we're allocating for reasons like we're putting a lot of extra pressure on a system that doesn't seem like it has a lot of capacity to expand to so it's, you know, that simple supply versus demand. And so I'm just wondering what, if we have a sense of what, there's got to be at least some part, maybe it's really tiny, but maybe right. it's not. Right. We're paying a premium because we don't have enough. I, I, I don't know what a number would, like that would be, but we do see when we look at um, even projects we funded, you know, and then they, uh, you know, now go out for their final bids. The increases have all gone up. But not in every area. We can see which products, you know, and like the most recent one was, I don't know, steel and mechanical systems, 65% increase from when they bid the project just six months ago. So it, it's really dependent, but I understand the nature of your question. I'm sure so there's the a amount of money we're putting into it. Is the amount of money we're putting into the, these programs actually causing prices to go We're competing against yourself and all of our other states. Infrastructure climate change investments, all that, I think um, the inflation and the, the, the Federal Reserve would support what you're saying, but um, the counter is, do you not do anything and wait? I don't yeah, have a- like kind of a, the, 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 the question of what do we do with that yeah. information, but I'm wondering like, what, do yeah. we even have a handle on how much of this cost increase problem is sort of of our own making? Yeah. I, with a completely uneducated, but I think there's a relationship to the inflation, the CPI we're seeing. That's probably you can account that some of these costs that that's about what we're paying as a premium because we're competing against a, a shortage of supply, and we're we're all paying a premium for everything. And uh, but I can't give you an exact number. I don't think that the way that the bids come back from you know the big GCs and projects they don't look at it that way, they tell you the increase in their labor costs, in their materials, their supplies, uh, all interest rates, you know, all those things have all gone up and added. Um, it just seems yeah. like it's a really important part of the picture is, you know, how, how is our policy actually driving costs? And so I don't know who would be yeah. doing this kind of study, but some, you know, there could be folks out there who are mm. sort of modeling this and thinking, 
well, if, if we weren't investing quite this much money in this area, we would see less growth in, in costs because yeah. the demand wouldn't be so high. And, and the only if thing- anybody's kind of doing that work in those areas, it just seems like it would be really important for us to, to know so that we, because we want to spend money efficiently. We want to get, you know, the most bang for our buck. And there's a certain point at which, you know, you, you spend more money, but you don't actually get anything because you just increased your own costs. And that would be really extreme. I'm sure we're not close to that, but it would be nice to know kind of like where along that line. We, we did a cost study in 2019. So it was before the pandemic and we were seeing our costs already increase then. We're seeing our affordable housing costs in Vermont increase at a higher rate than our other New England states. We have that study, can share it. It's got a lot of recommendations in there that people have been trying to implement. And so that was even before there was all this money to compete against ourselves on. Um, so that, that's interesting to com- sort of compare that to, to what you just presented. Um, so yeah. we looked at what other states, nearby states are investing compared to like the size of their housing market and compared to what Vermont's doing, you might be able to get some sort of a handle on whether prices in Vermont are going up faster than other places, maybe because we're investing money. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my example was, but it was before we were investing more money, we were already seeing those cost escalations. So there, there could be not um, a universal way to, 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 to sort of uh, quantify that, that theory because it was already happening before we were, had more money in the system. But I will, I will ask our, one of my uh, data folks at VHFA that, that has all of these cost numbers if there's any way to kind of try to quantify that. Thanks for you. Well, all right, we have our next witnesses. I need a break. Representative Tori. Really quick question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering about just your travels. I know you were in my community perhaps in some um, how successfully towns are doing um, building housing trusts mm. and capacity for mm-hmm. making um, investments and being prepared to make investments. Yeah, we've seen an uptick in, in housing councils and, and trusts. Um, you know, I think the sort of resources that can be raised are, you know, they're small. So the investments have to be very targeted. You know, otherwise, you know, if you only have $100,000 a year available and you're putting that $100,000 into one housing, $20 million housing project, how much is it really making it happen? Or is it feel good as opposed to um, really targeted investments? Like if you have a, uh, an employer, that's going to put up a match as well to, to maybe support a, a, a developer that's going to build some housing. And the employer is going to say, I want to ensure that employees have access to that. And you then have a match to ma- leverage that match. I think you see it in or small incentives. You know, Woodstock has got an interesting incentive right now to try and encourage uh, folks to rent to long term tenants as opposed to short term rentals with a thousand dollar sign on sort of bonus. Um, I think it's a mixed bag of how, what incentives are working, but I'm happy to see communities form these housing committees and these trusts and come up with creative ways to, and to keep finding, um, uh, you know, ways to fund them, you know, whether it's 1% option tax or just something, some ongoing investment. So it's not just a, a one-time sort of. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, members, we're going to take a five minute break. We're going to shift gears just a little bit and welcome Green Power uh, to talk about resiliency. And actually, I just want to note that we do have two members who are joining by Zoom today. So they're here. I feel like we don't have as many people, but they're, we're mostly here. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having us in today. My name is Candace Morgan. I work at Green Mountain Power. And this is my colleague, Mike Burke, um, who heads up our field operations um, and has been in that role now for uh, 14. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of time. Um, we were last here with you all back in January, I think, to just sort of give a brief introduction of the work that Green Mountain Power is doing, but also um, back in January, it was on the heels of some major storms that had happened already this winter. Since then, we've had two additional major storms. Um, many of these have been hitting for the southern part of our state quite a bit, but they are certainly um, increasing in frequency and also just an impact. We talk about um, what our customers are experiencing in these different parts of our territory. And so we wanted to share with you all today some of the work that we're doing, as well as some um, 
challenges that we're bumping up against in terms of how to get this done as quickly as we think we need to, to be best prepared um, for this upcoming winter, certainly, but also just in general, as we look out to um, all that we need our electric grid to, to do and um, accomplish as we look out for all of our um, climate goals and all the other work that folks are talking about. So that's kind of, I think, a big overview. Um, but we'll sort of be um, sharing this and happy to kind of answer questions along the way as well. Um, so let me just advance the slides. This is just an overview of who we are. I'll skip over that, but you certainly have it to, to reference. Um, so as I mentioned, um, storms are, are getting worse, and I'll turn it over to Mike to really speak about what we've seen this winter and just sort of the trends overall as we look out um, into this space. We've been watching the warmer weather over the last 10 years. And, you know, we were, we were at the point where maybe we had one or two heavy wet snowstorms in a winter and the other six or seven or eight were ice pristine snow that uh, blows around in the wind, doesn't stick to anything, really no effect on the electrical grid at all. Uh, this winter, uh, even though we've been watching it and ramping up and wanting to uh, do more and more resiliency projects or prepare our customers, things like that. This year, I think we've had 10 snowstorms, nine out of 10 of them were heavy wet snow. Uh, we had one in November that I re remember pretty well that was light and fluffy, no issues. Usually it's November, October, November that we get heavy wet. It was cold enough in November, we got a uh, nice dry snow. Every single storm since then uh, has been heavy wet snow starting on December 16th. Uh, the line right now in Vermont that seems to be about where we don't get a ton of damage. If you drew a line across Route 2 north, we're okay. Uh, route 2 south is literally every single one of these storms. We've had enough total precipitation to pretty much take whole trees down, break branches off, uh, things like that. And we don't see that trend changing. Uh, our forecasters are telling us. Even this year, I think moved a little quicker. It added urgency to what we want to do. And we expect that line of warmer weather to pretty much move. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if next year we're talking about the whole state. Because mm -hmm. uh, even a few of the storms we had this year uh, did affect the northern part of the state, but nowhere near as much as it did the southern part of the state. But one more quick thing to add. When we came in here previously, it was after a wind event. Mm -hmm. Well, the more warmth in the air and the more moisture in the air, leads to the higher winds. It creates a stronger low pressure system, uh, opposing a stronger high pressure system. And that's where you get the high winds that we got in that storm where Burlington had 72 miles an hour at the international airport, second highest wind speed they've ever had. So uh, the warmer weather is creating multiple effects. It's not just wet snow. And so as uh, Mike mentioned, and as I think we talked about uh, previously too, um, a few years ago, we actually worked within our um, regulatory process to develop a climate plan. And this climate plan was really focused on preparing our grid and our customers um, to weather these uh, more intense climate events that we were seeing. And so it includes um, both sort of your more traditional poles and wire solutions, as well as things like energy storage and batteries in both customers' homes and at the grid level to um, develop microgrids and resiliency zones and things that are really focused on keeping areas of the communities powered up, but then also really working um, at the customer level to you know, connect them with home battery solutions if that works for them, but then also really focusing on doing all that we can to strengthen our system so that the uh, outage events that folks experience are both less frequent and shorter in duration, right? which would allow them to kind of ride out an event with a battery if that's what they have or with other solutions in that as well. Um, and all of this is to say that we have been working with communities um, and really trying to develop plans that make sense for, for their areas. And so you'll see some of that work with our resiliency zones, which we can talk about more. Um, also, pan and microgrid, which I had uh, shared a little bit of information about with the committee too. So we're hoping to see more and more of that. But this all has to go hand in hand with some of our other solutions at the sort of grid level. Um, this is just a little bit more information about our energy storage work, which I'll probably just leave for you all to refer back to, um, but also happy to answer any questions related to batteries. 
um, I think it's it sort of helps um, create that overall uh, bit of work that we have to do to make sure that folks, you know, hopefully never experience an outage in the first place. Um, but I'll turn it over to Mike to speak a little bit about some of the what we talk about when we talk about storm hardening, because we like to say that, but to just sort of explain what that means. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about storm hardening, it's, it's really creating a stronger grid, uh, both by going underground, which I know you didn't hear a lot about in the past, or you heard reasons why you, you couldn't. We've actually found a cost-effective way that uh, is coming in close to what it would cost to rebuild and storm harden an overhead line, uh, but putting it underground instead. Uh, what you can see in your upper right-hand corner is the new style of underground. I think we talked about it last time, but what we're trying to do is strengthen the main lines, the ties between the substations with spacer cable, which is this here, that trees can literally lay on it. It doesn't knock the power out. We come in later, take the trees off. And then on the spurs that go out into the rural areas, everywhere we can put in that style of underground. Uh, if we run into ledge and things like that, we may have to pop overhead for a little bit, but the goal is to get the most we can underground. When you, uh, if you were to have driven around the Southern part of the state on around March 17th, you would see that it wasn't literally whole roads were just blocked with trees. Uh, uprooted from the weight of the snow in the trees. And it, that that's just not, again, we didn't have a dry snowstorm from de December 16th all the way till now. Uh, so it, it's become every storm this year, which is really why we're here and why we need to get even more urgency than we already had behind this. Mm -hmm. uh, the last night I met with Grafton to talk about the storm and we had just finished building one of these lines and a couple of customers in the meeting thanked us so much because there was trees on those lines. The, the power in that section never went out. We came in at the end of the storm and removed the trees. The road was never blocked. This stuff works is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the, the chart from NOAA, that's just the Northeastern United States. It shows the more intense storms coming. Uh, since 1980, we're experiencing 74% more extreme precipitation events in the Northeast. The rest of the country is dealing with other things. That's what we're dealing with here. And that, you know, whether it's flooding or heavy wet snow or ice, mm -hmm. uh, that's what's causing us the trouble. <clears throat> um, this just puts a bit of a finer point on, especially what I think the Southern part of Vermont has been experiencing in terms of um, outage frequency. And so this is data for the last three years that um, gives you a rough approximation of how many outage events customers are experiencing. Each of those dots, it gets a little funky, looks a little bit like a um, abstract artwork, but in general, the, the red, it's not great. The red, um, it's, those customers have experienced about 30 um, or more outages over the last three years. The darker green is, um, I think, one to five. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that are not there have not experienced any. Um, but as Mike mentioned, you know, we're kind of seeing that happen. Um, and it's really in this area that you see down here in um, Wyndham County and a little bit into Southern Windsor, um, where we have been running into some challenges as it relates to um, work that we need to do um, and how it ties in with Act 250. So in terms of utility, distribution utility projects, um, we, you know, there are various exemptions for uh, work that happens and gets reviewed in other regulatory processes. So uh, like section 248 uh, for uh, generation and substations and all that kind of stuff. Transmission. Transmission as well. Um, but in terms of regular electric distribution utility work, um, we do trigger Act 250 um, in various towns and it depends on whether or not they are uh, one acre or 10 acre and whether they have local review, uh, what that threshold is. And can you remind me the feet in which we- So in a, in a one acre town, if we try to rebuild a line that, it, say we're out in the woods in a 25, 30 foot right away and we're trying to come to the road. If we go 2,200 feet in a one acre town, it triggers Act 250. And, uh, you know, that's less than a half mile, right? It, it's not very far. And a lot of the lines we're talking about here go 14 miles from where they leave the main line out to where we're feeding customers. If those were in a 10 acre town, we could just follow all the same best management practices that we already have that have to do with water quality, 
uh, wildlife, wetlands, everything like that, and we can go in and rebuild it. And literally from the day we dream it up till the day it's done, probably six months. Uh, in the one acre towns, we have to have th it, things like site control and things like that. There's some lines down there that were in the fourth or fifth year that we've been trying to get all the right site control to be able to meet the criteria to even file. Uh, so we're running into some issues there. I wanna go back a little bit on, on the geography too. Yep. So a lot of this area is mid elevation, high elevation. Uh, that makes a big difference. It's also down in river valleys. So they actually get a lot of the worst weather in the state, even when it's not heavy wet snow. Uh, but again, we expect to get that everywhere, but that is what leads a lot to that. And you know, this type of construction we're talking about, we've put it in in other areas, it doesn't go out. And if it, you know, if it does, we've got it back on in two or three or four hours, not two or three or four days. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Just to clear absolutely. question on that. So you already have Act 250 permits and or you need a new one because you're relocating the line? That, what's the- Yeah, so the, the way it reads is if uh, new corridor, so if we're building exactly where we are uh, and we don't have a significant change, which is about 10 feet out of the ground, which normally our rebuilds do not go more than 10 feet out of the ground different than we already are. But if we try to get that line to say a state route 30, which is wide open, no trees, plenty of right away already developed. If we go 2,200 feet along route 30 to take the line from here to here, about a hundred feet difference, uh, if it's 2,200 feet, it triggers Act 250, whether it's in a fully developed state highway or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in a 10-acre town, we can actually rebuild almost five miles in a brand new corridor without triggering Act 250. Uh, so the big difference is it's a, it's a linear project, which none of this is new development. This is feeding existing homes and existing right-of-ways. And, you know, I think that... Yeah, I was going to say, actually... Before you move off that point, yeah. in some areas it's actually moving lines um, out of woods or out of the um, other more forested areas to right of ways too. So it would actually allow us to get out of um, sort of the cross country area, which you know is better for um, overall impacts in that space, and certainly better in terms of uh, both responding to outages and hopefully preventing them from happening in the first place as well by bringing them roadside. Mm -hmm. Do you turn to think I where I was. <laughs> and do the, do the towns have any jurisdiction over your work? Yes. So in the towns and state highways where we're not under Act 250, we actually have to file for either a V-trans permit or a town permit. And in those cases, the, the town, it's because they have zoning. Uh, the town usually, we also have a right to be in those state or town highways under Title 30, I think it is. And uh, so they do, they review it, they'll let us know if it's a view shed or they'll let us know if the poles are interfering with the travel way, where to put the poles, things like that. So yes, we still have to get permits, even in uh, where we don't need an Act 250 permit, we still go through permitting with VTRANS and with the local towns. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes. And if you were in a one acre town that didn't have zoning, you wouldn't need to get a permit. If we're in a one acre town, that doesn't have zoning, we do need to get the permits for 20, anything over 2,200 feet. From a, right, an Act 250 permit, but so you don't need a local permit or? Uh, no, we still put the, the, the select boards, we still file a town permit and we still file a V-trans permit yeah. and they still sign off on those permits. Yeah. And again, they still do all the review that the other towns do. The difference is they just don't have a development review board, yeah. I believe, is how the one acre, 10 acre yeah. was set up. And so you, you said VTRANS or a town permit, mm -hmm. not both. Correct. Because the town road or a VTRANS. Yes. Right. State highway. Yeah. So the reason why we're here today, in addition to wanting to um, share what we've been seeing and what we've been hearing from communities as we have gone down to visit um, and talk about uh, the challenging winter and sort of the projects that we have in the queue is that, you know, we think um, that there is potential to have a legislative solution that would be very tailored and focused um, to exempt uh, this work that we're talking about related to Act 250 um, 
for potentially just a time limited period or something to that effect that allows this work to really happen to, to sort of strengthen the backbone lines and the main feeder lines and all of the, the work that, um, you know, it's not just us, right, it's other utilities too, um, but it would be really focused just on this type of line rebuild that is directly related to reliability and resiliency work in that space, um, existing, existing lines, existing infrastructure. existing customers. That's right. You know, we, in these meetings, we're going to these towns, a lot of these towns know that we actually have been working on these lines to try to get them rebuilt for this time frame. Uh, we definitely feel the frustration they're feeling. I personally talk to a lot of customers and they're worried about their safety. They're, they're worried about a lot that's going out there. And the more we get of these storms, the more that is amped up. Uh, and you know, again, we don't see this changing and I just don't think we can continue to wait to make sure that we can do everything we can to, to help keep our customers safe. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of this has to do with. These are just some example projects too, as we think about and talk about um, both the areas that have been most impacted as well as the areas that have um, seen these projects kind of in the works for quite some time and that we haven't been able to advance to those um, requirements related to Act 250. Yeah, Act 250, you know, originally, if, if it didn't have a development review board, they were looking at a subdivision, stuff like that, because there was no one in the local town mm -hmm. to look at it. A lot of these projects go from a one acre town to a 10 acre town, one acre town to a 10 acre town. So it's even hard to figure out exactly what type of work we have to do uh, Route 30 is a perfect example of that. Uh, it goes through five towns. One has, a, it's a 10 acre and the rest are one acre. Uh, Route 30 is the same the whole way. Uh, but again, that one we've probably almost four years now tr been trying to get site control so we can e even apply for the permit. Mm -hmm. If that was a 10 acre town, uh, it would probably be have been built three years ago. Representative Sevilla. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your testimony today. Um, as you know, um, having come down to some of the towns that I represent, um, people are getting really upset and, um, and understandably so. And we are definitely seeing the increase here in the length of the outages because of the severity of the storm. Um, I noticed you did not provide information on kind of your your how things turn back on, but that was information that was really helpful for my constituents, um, but this is noticeable um, where, where I live and for my people, what's happening over time. Um, uh, the increase in the outages, the increase in the extent. I mean, we've had uh, uh, one of my towns, Wardsboro, you know, they have been out multiple times this year for four days or, or longer. And uh, this is an area where we're still trying to build telecommunications infrastructure. Um, these folks are pretty isolated. Uh, so this feels um, extremely urgent to me in terms of um, adaptation, uh, people being able to uh, have their medical equipment working, um, uh, food, um, heat, et cetera. So, uh, you know, and, and I know we actually, uh, we actually heard from some of the other utilities. I think you talked about um, Christmas time. There was, there was an issue up north, um, I think in uh, Vermont Electric, uh, also seeing similar issues with this wetter and wetter snow. And also the difficulty of bringing projects to construction. Yes. Uh, you know, the area, I'm sorry. Could... And the wind. I mean, you know, last week I was sitting here and, you know, in one of these areas where we are seeing these extensive outages, I just started getting emails. It was a beautiful day, but, uh, you know, it was out because of the strength of the winds um, in some of these areas where there's this extreme need to rebuild. So, Representative Pat. A um, couple of questions. First of all, this, this kind of, trigger stuff I was dealing with in a past life. But um, uh, in, in terms of uh, when, when something currently does trigger uh, Act 250, um, 
Can you just, is there, a, can you generally describe how much of that is, is that, is, is that uh, how much uh, of that is contested issues or whether, whether it's just going through the process and, and getting the, um, uh, is any way you can generalize around that and then have one other question. Uh, some of the BMPs that we have uh, that we created with the Agency of Natural Resources had to do with, I think there was three cases in the state of Vermont where uh, a pentapole uh, leached a little bit. And so we came up with uh, best management practices on water quality and uh, surface water, uh, whether it's to use a different style pole, something like that, to keep that from happening. Uh, we had those in place already, but some that can come up uh, but usually we've come to agreement on that and the type of pole that uh, was being brought up as the issue is no longer man manufactured. So that's gone away. Uh, usually that's about the extent of uh, a lot of it is review after we've already worked with wetlands, with A&R, with it. Uh, so not always contested, but just in incredibly time consuming because of the site control and things like that. And, and just follow up. So it sounds like the, a, any of the back and forth is with the regulators, not so much with public uh, people, you know, like uh, affected landowners, whatever. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. But, okay. No, no, I mean, it's just a different. Uh, I was asking both. Um, uh, the, the the other question is, I'm, I'm just curious in terms of whether you can make a general overall statement in terms of. Uh, the work that you're doing, how much of it is this new infrastructure materials and stuff in existing locations and how much of it is, uh, you know, as a general percent, actually moving lines from off-road and uh, in the woods kind of locations, uh, which is, uh, I imagine, I mean, it's a lot more work putting new poles in new places. Uh, our goal if we are say 200 feet off road in a forested corridor is always to come to the road. It instantly gives you a 60 foot clearance on one side and usually state highways are pretty well. And then we, in, in other words, we're coming to an already cleared area where our crews can actually restore and work in a much safer condition than they can when they're out climbing poles and doing it all on foot. So our goal is to move all of those types of lines to a state or town highway. Uh, if I had to guess the percentage where we do that or where we're not able to do that, it's probably 60 to 70% move it to the road and then the other 20 to 30, uh, sometimes we just can't get the permits or the uh, land rights, things like that. And what we're doing, those types of lines uh, in those forested areas, we're, we're trying to go underground where we can. and those are places where if we can do it cost effectively, where it's not a main tie between substations for feeder backup and things like that, then we've, we've been doing it cost effectively for more rural res residential areas. For the bigger things that we're using the uh, spacer cable on, those are the ones that we're really trying to get to the road because that the reason that works so well is there's over a half inch st solid steel cable on top of the pole above all the conductors. So that can take a hit from a tree. We've actually had car pole accidents uh, where it's hit, broke three poles, it stays 30 feet in the air. The customers never even know it happened. We come replace the poles. And but the downside to that, it's pretty hard to work on off hooks 30 feet up on a pole. Uh, climbing a pole. So that's why we want to get those things to where we can access them with our trucks uh it makes it a lot safer for our crews and a lot safer for our customers so um okay uh, i think we may be having technical issues with our video oh. feed um but i just have one i just want to clarify one point so you still you're sort of saying that you have um like the active 50 process is particularly slow because you're waiting for i think landowner permission agreements, right? But don't you already have those in these cases that you're talking about? I mean, you still need them even if you are getting out of active food. So uh, yes, we need those, whether we're in active. And remember, we're already doing everything we talk about in any town that's 10 acre. 
this isn't new. It's not like we're asking for something that we don't already do. It, it's just we can only do it in about half of Vermont. Uh, if we, to your question on on Title 30, where we're already allowed in state and town right of ways, if we need an anchor easement or if we need uh, an overhang easement that goes outside the three rod or four rod road, then we need private rights. And uh, in the Act 250 process, if you don't have those rights and you turn it in and then you have to change it, you actually have to go start it all over again. So that's why we have to get the uh, site control before we can file for Act 250. So yes, we do need to get those rights either way. The difference is in a 10 acre town, we can build everything but that one issue we're having and maybe we can just go underground through that area. In a one acre town, we can't even start. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Um, okay, uh, I think if there are further questions, probably need to take a break and make sure that we're actually streaming. Oh. So let's take a pause and are you mailing shoddy? Great, we're gonna uh, continue our meeting and we had a couple of other questions but I can't remember, Representative Morris. Hey, Madam Chair, um, so the difference between a one acre and a 10 acre, what, what would make this process easier? Um, recommendations, I, I didn't see any recommendations. In that's right, yeah, so um, that's a great question and I, we're certainly, um, we're starting this process uh, to share our recommendations with, you know, both the Agency of Natural Resources, the Natural Resources Board, and other interested parties. And so we do have some draft language that would provide a very narrow um, exemption from Act 250 for these types of projects, which would allow us to have um, sort of the same treatment for all of our distribution uh line rebuilds that are focused on reliability. I just want to give folks an opportunity to um, provide any edits or feedback, but I would follow up with the committee um, with that language once folks had a chance to, to review that um, and offer any suggested changes. So that would be our, um, uh, our ask um, and offer as a solution that might be something that would allow us to, to get this work done um, following all the best management practices and all of our other work that we have to do. Um, and are happy to do in that space and really allow us to build these um, in a much more timely fashion. Madam Chair, is there anything in this, do we have any jurisdiction over this from this committee or? Is, is... It, it, in, yeah, Title 10, if it's Title 10, we would, yeah. And it's energy. Yeah. And it's energy, <laughs> there you go, both. Yes, is the answer. Representative Sevilia. Yeah, just uh, while we have you here and thinking about um, increasing intensity of storms, um, are there other things that the legislature should be thinking about that you are doing that we should know about um, to keep the lights on? Sure. I mean, we can, we touched on it a little bit in terms of, um, you know, the other side of this work uh, and all of what we're working on includes a lot of focus on um, you know, home battery storage, also resiliency zones, which are um, areas that we have worked with communities um, after looking through a variety of different indicators. Um, the social vulnerability index provided by the CDC um, connection from a telecom or a phone service perspective, we kind of looked at all of our towns and found the ones that ranked pretty high in terms of um, these various risk factors have been working with the towns of Brattleboro, Grafton, and Rochester um, to really target some solutions that will hopefully maintain, um, you know, uh, maintain their uh, power in sort of downtown areas or in key community areas. So for example, in the town of Brattleboro, we're working with the, um, a mobile home park there to provide a large scale battery that will help keep that um, area powered up. Um, in the town of Rochester, we're focusing on a solar plus storage uh, microgrid. And in the town of Grafton, we're actually uh, focusing on folks that are furthest away from uh, the substation there and experience a good amount of outages and working with them to provide uh, home battery backup. So that's a really exciting thing that is, I think, rec replicable. Um, and we're looking forward to working with the next round of towns on all of that work as well. But always happy to talk about all, any of that anytime because um, there's a there's a lot of really exciting stuff that we're doing. I don't know if there's anything else that comes to mind for you. 
infrastructure funds. Yeah, uh, that's uh, true. You know, if there's anything that infrastructure funds fund, it's less that our customers have to fund. So yep. uh, I know that we had a group committee putting out uh, recommendations for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Candace actually mm -hmm. led that. So last year, yeah, there's that too. And then I, I just think an awareness and of the weather and how the wind you were talking about, we had predictions of 45 at the summit and maybe 40 at 1500 feet. We got, we got mid fifties all the way down to the Connecticut river. So just even the forecast and what's actually happening is changing so much. And I think the models just aren't keeping up with it, with, with how quickly things are changing. So I just an overall preparedness for the continued change in climate, I think is something that we can all think about. Uh, it's certainly why we're here. Uh, and, you know, thinking of the actual infrastructure, this would go a long way. Uh, it would go a long way. We've, we've built these lines in 10 acre towns. Uh, I don't know if anyone here lives near uh, the Appalachian Gap. We rebuilt, storm hardened the line literally from Bristol substation all the way up to Jerusalem store. Uh, they used to have similar type of uh, reliability issues just based on where they were. And literally, that's not a place we worry about anymore. Uh, you mentioned Wardsboro. Uh, we have projects for Route 30 all the way from uh, Jamaica back to Brattleboro. Wardsboro taps right out of the center of that. We have a project with the same type of construction going all the way up into the village of Wardsboro. Uh, this would really change things and anything you can do to support to allow us to get that done would, uh, would really change things for everybody. And we, we have plans all over the state for that type of construction. It's just right now, that's where we're seeing the most damage and that's where we wanna act. Any other barriers to being able to move quickly? That we should be thinking about? Do you, I mean, do you have the resources that you need? Like, like what's, do you feel like you're being held back in other ways besides this? Uh, we have already been planning on how to ramp up to get these done. Uh, and there is resources that can come in and help project manage this to make sure we're doing it absolutely as efficiently as we can and get it done. So uh, we haven't run into anything like that as of yet. Uh, certainly with all the broadband work and resiliency work going on, uh, we'll see. We, we haven't seen that yet. We've had the available help we've needed. I think supply chain is, remains a, just a general observation, right? I think we've worked really hard to um, get what we need to get here for this type of work, um, but it's, it remains just a, I think a question mark for lots of this, lots of different planning purposes. That's a great point. We, I've actually had conversations with uh, our manufacturers about, you know, we're, a lot is coming and even more is coming. The DOE currently has uh, a grant out there to create a high-speed undergrounding system. And right now we're ahead of the curve in terms of utilities trying to take over headlines and put them underground. But I think if that uh, DOE grant is successful, that uh, where we had the CHIPS Act, we may want to look at underground cable, storm hardening cable, things like that to make sure there's plenty of it to go around. <laughs> that may become an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, members, further questions? Uh, Representative Pat, then Bongart. <coughs> um, uh, uh, Representative Morris asked uh, uh, um, uh, one of my questions, which mm -hmm. is which is that you you are in fact working and talking with various parties on actual specific language for this uh, basically an interim. Uh, 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 short short term proposal, um, and it, it sounds to me like th this is something. If we if we get if we get this language and we choose to, uh, we have a bill in our committee that came over from the Senate um, uh, at the end of last month. That's called it's the annual and act related to um, uh, miscellaneous uh, uh, subjects under the PUC jurisdiction or some something like that. And it's it's uh, it's very common. That the very the two bodies add language to <laughs> to each other's bills as, as this would be another if, if we wanted to do this, this this could be another miscellaneous item to send back to the Senate. Representative Bongratz. Just going back to the Act of 50, I just want to understand this a little bit. Um, 
do most of when you are in, let's say, one acre town, or it's harder for you, um, do your applications tend to go through as minors? Or do you have hearings or do they go through as minors? We have requested hearings and sometimes there is hearings. Uh, I think a lot of them do go through as minors. Uh, I, I think it's a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. so, so just help me understand the time because I've, I've, I've uh, seen through Active 50 applications before. Mm -hmm. And um, minors tend to be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but there's something going, there's something that I'm not, something more going on. Yeah. So, a normal Act 250 where you're building, right? Yeah. You all, you have site control when you bought the land. The difference here is, again, we could be going three miles between three towns, and there may be 200 property owners along the way. And anywhere we need an anchor easement or anything like that, we have to get signed off easement rights and have that site control before we can even apply for the permit. So the you have to get no, let me interrupt, but you have to get that in any event, right? No. Oh, okay. So no, if we if we don't have because they're if we're under just our normal best management practices and a town permit, we can actually build everything but maybe the one or two property owners that we can't seem to get the site control from. So we could build, if it's a five mile project, we could build 4.8 miles of it, put that into service while we continue to work with that other customer. If it's under Act 250 because of site control, and if you make a change after you turn it in, you have to go back and submit a new permit. And that, so that's the pre, uh, the pre Act 250, and then uh, an average Act 250 permit for everything, I think, is around 77 days. We were told mm -hmm. ours tend to go a little longer because of the linear uh, versus one lot. All right. Thank you for coming in. Thank you all for the Thank time. You. Really appreciate it. We'll follow up um, in very short order with what the specific language looks like so folks can consider it and we'd be happy to come back in and, and talk through that at the uh, time too if helpful. Sure. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, with that, we are gifted with witnesses for the day. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to start over with the General Housing Committee on a joint hearing in the pavilion office building and we'll be in room 267 at 9 15 which is when they start so we'll see you over there then that we're adjourned okay.